we had an emergency meeting with my interior decorator. <laughs> she insisted we come down and see swatches and samples. Uh, like this was like a DEF CON 2 situation. Yeah. So we did a night and we went to Louis Bossy. Yeah. Solid. Uh, that's good, right? Solid place, yeah. And then we went to the lobster one. What's that one? Chops Lobster Bar. Chops Lobster Bar. That is good. That's a solid I mean, both place. were good. Expensive. Well, Chops is expensive. But I'm from New York. So, yeah, so not New York expensive. <laughs> right. Florida, Boca expensive. Okay. But very solid. Both uh, good are those restaurants. like go-tos for you? For, for you those or are like, definitely like- What are your spots? Give me your spots. Did you grow up there? No, I grew up in New Jersey. I was born in Queens. Okay. Grew up in New Jersey. Um, but I've been in Boca now for, or the area in Boca for 18 years. You look healthy. I don't think you and I eat the same thing, but like, give me, give me some, <laughs> well, give me some recommendations. Sure. I own, I own a gym in Florida too. Oh, so, oh, so that, that, that'll help. <laughs> Where do you go? Well, I, I love those places. Those are two good okay. places. I'm a, I'm a little bit of a pizza person though. Okay. So Say I, more. I have a couple, two favorite pizza places in Boca that you have to try. One, not far from where you're talking about. There's an East Boca called Tucci's. Okay. Very, very good. Kind of like a wood. Slices fire. or pies? Uh, I think you can do both. Definitely pies. I'm not sure about slices. Like the, like, oh, like a, like a wood fired it's oven. Like a wood fired, like New Haven style yeah, a little yeah, bit, yeah. but not, okay. not too burnt. Tucci's. And, got it. Tucci's. And then in West Boca, my friend owns Aunt Lulu's Pizza, New York style. It's the only good New York style pizza in South Florida. Really? Uh, yeah. It's fantastic. Okay. And uh, just reviewed by Dave Portnoy, I gave a really nice What score. did he say? He gave her a high sevens, which for a New York style pizza in Florida is actually quite yeah. high. But her especially food, if you're claiming to be New York style yeah. and you're in Florida, you better put up. She she does an amazing job, and all of her other Italian food there. It looks like a pizza place. She calls it a pizza place, but the Italian food there is unbelievable. Okay, here's what my friends who live there said: the sushi is problematic. Well, versus New York, how could that be yeah. though? It, Honestly, no. There's some oh, there's some pretty good sushi. That's what I said. There's got to be something. Yeah, it's, you just can't go to any old. Sushi place, right? There's a that's, lot of them. That's where it's probably well, like in New York, you're pretty much okay no matter what. Yeah, like for the most part. Yeah, it's not that way there. No, yeah. It, with most food in South Florida, you gotta be a little more selective okay. than you would have to be. What's here. your What's your sushi spot? <sighs> sushi wise, there's. See, I actually live a see, couple towns north. Yeah, yeah you gotta be careful. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you gotta be careful. Uh, <laughs> All right, no, I'll give you a couple of places, right. but they're not like pizza is my. That's my I'll, thing. I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, I'm with you. Uh, all right, we'll fi we'll figure that out. We'll figure all that out later. One thing I will say, every one of my favorite restaurants in New York or on Long Island yeah. is now open yeah, in, in Florida, South Florida. In South Florida, yeah. If it's not yeah. in Miami or Fort Lauderdale, it's in Boca. It's yeah. somewhere. We're getting an H and H bagels in Boca coming yeah. soon. Like we got, we're getting all of the New York stuff. Dude, I have Il Molino across around the corner for me. Yeah, I don't need anything else. Yeah, no, like, I'm, I'm good to go. You all don't right. even have to go to Miami even now. You can just be Boca, Delray, Fort Lauderdale. So last question: uh, When I come down there for the winter, is like, can we hang out? Yeah, of course we can hang. Oh, out. I don't know, Florida Absolutely. Jew talk. How, how often are you in New York City? <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually up here quite a bit. I, ha I still have a place up here. I have a place on the Upper West Side. My daughter goes to NYU, so I'm actually up here quite a bit. Okay. We took her out for sushi last night. Actually. What is she studying there? She is studying musical theater and film acting at, right. at NYU Tisch. Yeah, so Duncan, Duncan's a director. What were you credited on? You're you have what? you have, you have directing <laughs> credits. Can you put his daughter in in your next film? Yeah, eighty yeah. directing credits. No, no, eighty assistant director. Assistant director. That's different. Eighty, eighty, eighty. Kind of Shout out to Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> any any help you can be for my daughter? You know, NYU is expensive. Tish is good. <laughs> yeah, it's that's a very good school. Really good. Yeah, it's great. Uh, it's not expensive enough. That's uh, probably the. You the know issue. what I'm finding out because I have a son who's about to go to college yeah. too. Uh, NYU is not as expensive as I thought compared to a lot of. Oh, there's other worse. Oh yeah. I have, was reading. Have prices stopped going up? No, <sighs> I, I don't know honestly because no. I don't know what they were before my daughter went. But it, it just feels hot. I mean, I'm yeah, you know, I'm 50 years old now. So like that, I remember what I, I went to Rutgers State University. Yeah, you know, really cheap. You know, for and I was an in-state student, so it was really, really. It's probably like six thousand dollars a year. Probably then. something in that range. Yeah. So yeah. they're not the prices are not going down because the pool of applicants for colleges have exploded because the unemployment rate for college graduates is like one yeah. percent, yeah. and the lifetime earnings is like six hundred percent higher. Yeah. And we haven't done a great job with vocational promoting vocational schools in this country, which is what we should do because we need people who can actually do things. Um, not just think and, and, and talk all day. Um, so the prices are higher than ever and only going in one direction. Yeah. And arguably, student loans have a really big role to play in those high prices. Yeah. 
it's like extra money. And so people are like, oh, so let's spend it here. Yeah, it's, it's not surprising that the federal loan level, you know, that tuition often Corresponds is just to about tuition that. rising. <laughs> yeah. I went to the Harvard of Long Island. I spent $4,000. So that's Queens College. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Queens College. That's it. You have, you have a kid applying the schools now? Or, yeah. or he's, just gonna... he's a junior now in okay. high school uh, in Boca. And he we started, we were in, I, you guys were just in Colorado, weren't you? Yeah. Because I was just in Colorado. You looked at Boulder? Him. Yeah, we looked at Boulder. Sick school. I, I think I'm going to go there. I, I, know. I don't care if he goes but, there. But you have- um, nice. I've never spent time there. Really nice. It's gorgeous. But it's you guys have the Bright Scholar program where features, effectively yeah. if he gets into like Gainesville or something, it's free. Yeah, yeah with good grades. There's, there's like a whole bunch of, you know, wickets you have to get past. But if you have good grades- But it's a lot of kids get that. Yeah. If you go to Florida State School, it's actually a pretty- Pretty sweet deal. But it sounds like you want him to have a different experience. Well, he likes, uh, so far he likes FSU. So there's a chance oh, okay. he'll stay. Right. Um, and, you know, but that's a tough school to get into. And that's the other thing that's changed since I- Where's FSU? Jacksonville? Uh, Tallahassee? Tallahassee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tallahassee. It, you know, like I couldn't get into Rutgers today. Like, you know, I, yeah. I don't think I, my test scores- That's true for everyone. Yeah. I, I've, all of these name brand schools have gone way up in difficulty. Yeah. Um, to the, like there are schools that people used to joke around about because mm -hmm. it was a party school yeah. that are now like uh, denying 70% of the applicants. I, I've so been it's not like that, that yeah. anymore. Yeah, it's very different. You're right. I think that's what it is. They create this uh, difficulty, right? They raise the hurdles so much that it becomes a very competitive That's school. just a function of more kids going. Yeah. it's Because it, the schools can't grow commensurate in, in like actual geographical size. They can't get big enough yeah. for the amount of kids that now apply. Yeah. It's just, it's crazy. It is. And there's, and there's international competition, which we probably had less of, right, when we were in school. And so, there, yeah, it's just it's just tougher. When I see the SAT scores that he needs to get in order to get into, like, an FSU, it's very, very high. Well, so one of the things, so we, so one of the things that exists now that might not exist by the time your junior applies, and I have one in uh, ninth grade, mm -hmm. is uh, the test optional stuff might yeah. go away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's already starting in some places. Some yeah. places are already saying, yeah. how about not test optional? So yeah. now if you didn't have to do, like, a... SAT prep. Now you have to, yeah, you have to for a lot more schools. I think it was Yale that recently went back to it, right? And they and yeah. they had said there was no better correlation than the SAT on the future. I don't know if it's graduation rate, graduation rates or success rates of their students than yeah. the SAT, which is surprising. But I'm surprised by that too because I would have thought grades, like the consistency mm -hmm. of four years worth. Of, not that that doesn't matter, but yeah. I guess I was surprised. Uh, so we didn't have to do test testing this time. Mm -hmm. So we had my daughter just lean into academics and mm -hmm. she's a, uh, she's like in 10 AP classes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. So the college the advisor thing. was like, look, just lean into your grades. The yeah. most important thing right now. And, and thank God it worked. And you so. do get like a, uh, you get a boost if you take uh, AP credits, right? Well, of it's course. Boost your GPA of course. and all that. Yeah. So I'm, I, I think when I was in high school, the, there was maybe one or two available AP classes. Oh, now, now it's like, the high tons. schools are now like college. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a whole different, now they have to choose their curriculum in ninth grade yeah. and they basically have to decide what they want to major in when they're 14. It's pretty amazing. Actually. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, all right. Thank God that wasn't my, my experience. I don't know <laughs> if I would have made it. Hey, John, how are we doing? All right. Hey, John, what episode is this? Today's show is brought to you by Rocket Money. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills so that you can grow your savings. Duncan, one of my favorite emails that I get is large transaction detected. Oh, what's that? Or even better than that, large refund issued. I go to Rocket Money, see what's going on, make sure everything's copacetic. If I want to cancel anything, I could uh, pretty much do it right in the app. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has saved a total of $500 million in canceled subscriptions, saving members up to $740 a year when using all of the app's features. So stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash compound. That's rocketmoney.com slash compound. Episode 136. Man, we have, we have some show for you. Guys, I'm so excited. We haven't talked stocks in a long time in the show. We talk about the stock market yeah. more than we... I was just telling I was telling Dan. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest today on The Compound and Friends, Dan Davidowitz. Dan is the lead portfolio manager 
of Poland Capital's focused growth strategy. Poland Capital is a global asset manager running active, high conviction, growth equity, and high yield credit strategies for clients. Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jens. Thank you for having me. We're so excited that you're here. I'm excited to be here. So, dude, you have a tan. <laughs> you're in shape. Dude, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look and feel like you five well, years from now. Well, that's Florida. It's just Florida. I know that's that. It is, yeah. No, I know. But it's a, it's a whole thing. <laughs> People that go down there, yeah. then you see them again a year later. Yeah. They're like good. I didn't look this good when I worked in New York. You didn't. I know you're not even joking though, right? <laughs> I'm not joking. Okay. You know what I did like five minutes ago? I had a slice of cold pizza in the rain on the way to the office I like because that. I was sitting in traffic for an hour. You don't do that in Florida. On the FDR. Who's doing that? And then because that wasn't enough, then I had a blueberry uh, muffin. Nobody is doing <laughs> Duncan, the way that. Duncan, <laughs> edit out the muffin. We don't need to hear about the muffin. The muffin was on top of that. Nobody's doing this in Florida. No. People really. are relaxed. They're taking their time. Yeah. Well, Florida, you're going to learn this though. Florida drivers are actually worse than anything you've seen up here. Meaning like too slow or too reckless? There's too slow. There's too fast. There's too young, too old, and everybody's texting at the same time. So it's it. it's just a confluence of terrible. Well, I don't plan on driving. I plan on rollerblading, there you go. wearing jean shorts. I don't give a shit. So Dan, Once how I long how long have you been uh, with Poland? What's your story? Uh, I've been at Poland uh, over 18 years now. Uh, I originally, I, as I mentioned, I went to Rutgers University across the river. I was a public health major. Believe it or not, I wanted to work in hospitals, hospital administration. Uh, but as I was, I was working at Sloan Kettering Cancer Center right out of college, not too far from here. And this was during the tech bubble. And all of a sudden I started to get interested in stocks for all yeah. the wrong How reasons. <laughs> yeah, all the wrong reasons. And so I ended up uh, going back to school at night. I ended up getting my MBA at Baruch College right here in the city and uh, decided I was going to pivot into equity research. And this is, I graduated in 1999. It was like, you know, perfect, right? Yeah. And, uh, but nobody wanted to hire me. I wasn't coming from NYU. I wasn't coming from Columbia. I didn't have any real relevant experience. So I ended up working, uh, do you guys, I, I don't know if you're even old enough to know Value Line. Of course. You remember Value Line, the one page tear sheets? Yeah. That's where I got my first job in the industry. That's how people did research. They went to the library yeah. and got the quarterly Value Line. Yep. Literally. You know, flip the pages, this right? This is pre-internet shit. Yeah. It okay. would match your green books over there. Yes, if you want to put absolutely. It over, over there. It's actually right down the street here, Valley okay. Line, like a couple blocks from here. And uh, I worked there for a year, just really learning how to uh, research companies. The funny thing, in hindsight, it was funny. At the time, it wasn't so funny. was I took a, a massive pay cut to go from a not-for-profit hospital to Valley Line. But I needed to do it. I needed to restart my career. And so I learned how to research companies there. The wonderful thing about Value Line is with all their turnover, they have a ton of alumni yeah. too. So one of them hired me to work at a, a deep value investment firm in New Jersey, which is where I really kind of learned how to do research. And that was after the bubble burst? Yeah. So you guys probably killed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, they did well enough, but not great. Uh, and it, part of the problem was that this place that I went to, which no longer exists, uh, was it was it was just so deep value like low PE low price to book almost was this Stratton Oakmont <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. but they, these are guys that kind of learn from David Dream in the contrarian oh, yeah, yeah. style which That's was cigar butt stuff cigar butt yeah, That's yeah, too yeah. contrarian too, too contrarian, contrarian. Right. And, and they ended up just buying a whole bunch of crap too uh, yeah. and and this is kind of I'm still learning like what I want to invest in at this time and. I was recommending companies, and this is like date me a little bit. This is like 2002, three, four, and I'm recommending like Harley Davidson, United Health, which at the time were high quality growth compounders. Yeah, they, but they had a PE of 12, so they were high. wildly expensive. Too high, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like the I market. Remember. The market's only 15 you, or 12. You can't have a 15 multiple, right? Right. right. So I, I realized I needed to kind of find something that was more aligned with what I was thinking. So, like, God forbid, you buy a decent company, right? Yeah. You just hope it's not as bad as what the market thinks it is, right? And I, I, that was just not for me. So I started to study some investors that did more of what we would call today quality compounders. And Poland Capital was one. Uh, a friend of mine was interviewing at Poland Capital, and he decided he wasn't going to move to Florida. So he took himself out of the running. I kind of jumped in. And luckily, David Poland, you know, who was our founder, uh, he really liked me. But I think he liked 
the idea of me a little bit more than me because what do you mean by that? He, he 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 wanted to hire a Jewish kid from the Northeast. Yeah, there's and, not that many of those in finance. Well, where, where would he? But you know, it's funny. It's like a needle in a haystack. But Poland Capital didn't have many at the time, <laughs> okay. believe it or not. Even though we were in Boca, and he loved Value Line. So the fact that I worked at Value Line, oh, he was okay. like, "Oh my gosh!" You know, so you checked a few boxes. I checked some for him. boxes. Yeah. Okay. Um, not a lot of analysts can make the jump. Yeah. From researching companies to portfolio management. Yeah. Uh, did you know you wanted that to happen in your career? And how did that opportunity first arise? I wasn't sure. Well, I wasn't really sure, I guess. I knew I loved research. Okay. Um, and when I was working at that other firm in New Jersey, it, it didn't seem like a big leap because most of the researchers were portfolio managers. I was one of the few that was just a researcher. Okay. And then when I got to Poland Capital, David, he was the only portfolio manager. We only had one product. The one that I run today, Focus Growth, was the original Poland Capital portfolio. It's the only one that we had. So I didn't think there was going to be an opportunity. He was the one running it. So I was just going to be a researcher for him. Uh, but uh, you know, after I got there, within a year or two, a lot of clients, we were small back then. We were only managing about a billion or two. Uh, in AUM. And a lot of clients were insisting that he have a succession plan because at the time he was in his uh, late 50s, early 60s. And, you know, you need to have some sort of succession plan. So right. um, he decided he was going to have a co-portfolio manager and he picked me to be his co That's so PM. cool. That's awesome. How much money is in the strategy now? Uh, today, it's a little over 50 billion. 50? In the in the one strategy. And we have a whole bunch of other strategies and teams now. At wow. Yeah, so. Very good. Uh, let's start here. Today... Uh, Sam Bankman Freed, who is totally innocent, <laughs> was sentenced to 25 years in prison. The prosecutors were asking for, I think, 40 years, yeah. which would have put him in jail until he was 70 years old. He's 32. Yeah, he's young, right? So that would have been, he would have come out of jail at 72. Not that anyone actually finishes a sentence, but just like yeah. that sounded too much, like even to me. And I'm not like a defender of scam artists. Yeah, They he didn't kill anybody. Um, and I think pretty much most people, even though it's been a horrendous few years, are going to get their money out. Yeah. I also think a lot of the victims I would put in quotes because there was a lot of greed and a lot of people sh who should have known better that these returns are not realistic or possible. No, wait, wait, wait hold on. Hold on. This you isn't know, made this off. Is this isn't made off. What do you mean these returns? What returns? If you had your money at FTX, you got wiped no, out. No, the, ret the returns of the asset class itself. Now, they're victims, man. If you had your money at I FTX, agree you most are victims. No, but you use their quotes. They, they're, they're, well, they're victims. Well, because you think firms like Three Hours Capital- I'm not, I'm, talk I'm not talking about them. Okay. All right. So that I am. So that's where we disagree. <laughs> uh, no, hang on. Hang on. The retail people who had their money at FTX were we victims. We 100% agree okay. on that. Okay. Uh, but they're going to be okay financially, even though it's been not, not great. Well, it's just, I think what you're getting at is like- why is anybody surprised that greed in markets leads to frauds? You know, like you know, that you should right. investors should know this, you know, right. to some degree and do some diligence. But the reality is, they don't. Right? A lot well, of people you don't. almost could not have done diligence on him yeah. because he came out of nowhere, yeah. and immediately some of the most well-known and respected venture firms yeah. were in business with him. Yeah. And then he was naming stadiums, and then he had Tom Brady. And it's like, what? so a retail person is supposed to no. look behind the veil and find something that none of these other people found? No it's, way. No. It's crazy. No, and, and they're like, they're right. these are proof points, right? You get somebody social with a- Social proof. Yeah, social proof. You get le legitimate backers and you start to put your name on things. People think you're a substantial. If it's good enough for Tom Brady. Yeah, I mean, look, not that Tom <laughs> Brady should be the extent of someone's due diligence, but it's not just Tom Brady. It's like huge but the social private equity firms and venture yeah. firms. But the social proof for the average investor is that too, though. Even Tom Brady, it's like, well, you assume Tom Brady's people did research, right? 100%. <laughs> you assume he's got caretakers that are doing it. Meanwhile, that. he like played golf with the kid and, yeah. and, and they wrote him a check. Yeah. Anyway, he got what he deserved. You uh, think so? 25 years? Uh, what, well, you think it's too harsh? I think he's going to do 12. The guy from WorldCom did like half a sentence. Uh, what was it, Bernie Ebers? So throw this chart up, John. So, right. Made up? Oh, you're talking about Bernie Ebers from, uh, from, yeah. from WorldCom. World yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The president, Jeffrey Skilling, Skilling from Enron did 14 years. What? Wait, wait this, oh, this is everyone's. Oh, is that the <laughs> Sam Waxel, remember that one? Elizabeth Holmes, she was doing some pretty bad shit. She got 11 years. She oh, got yeah. 11 years. We don't know if she'll serve. Them. Right, right, right. These are the sentences. Oh, okay. that's interesting. Elizabeth Holmes got 11 years while pregnant, which is pretty, <laughs> right? Wow. Uh all right. So look, I, I'm not saying was it just or not, I guess, because who knows? Uh, well, listen, so here's, here's. I guess the question is, are you surprised that he got you 25? Sound, you sound like you're not. I'm not. No. I we, guess I'm confused, like uh, sentences in general, like for awful things, 
sometimes, like where people do die or, or you know, something very harmful. Sometimes the sentences are not nearly long enough. The judge, right? the and, judge said he's convinced that if given the opportunity, SBF would do it again. And I think the judge is right. So that's why he didn't get the max, but he also didn't get a slap on the wrist. Yeah. His, because he spent the trial lying. His lawyers, <laughs> his lawyers wanted six years in prison saying, this is from a journalist, saying he still had much more to offer to society, LOL. <laughs> they pointed to his autism, his deep remorse, and his charitable works as a reason for his lenient sentence. There was, somebody uh, uncovered this a couple of weeks ago that like his document for like uh, playing out what his defense should be, like, should I go full Republican? Should I say this? Should I say that? No, I did. I shouldn't do this. Should I lean into the autism? Like it was wild. Really, U.S. District Judge Lewis Kaplan, who also imposed more than eleven billion in financial pen penalties, said he weighed quote the enormous harm he did, the brazenness of his actions, his exceptional flexibility with the truth, lol, <laughs> and his apparent lack of any real remorse. He's not remorseful at all. He's pissed that the bubble blew up before he could put all the money back that he misappropriated. He's not like, he doesn't, I'm sure he feels bad that people lost money, but that's like an abstraction to him. He, he might've escaped. People. He might've escaped. He might've gotten away with it. If um, the three hours didn't blow up, he might've escaped. If the dominoes didn't start falling. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree. And I think there's probably no remorse there. And there might not even be 10 years into a sentence because it's a personality type. Um, do you see the picture of the parents in front of the courtroom today? So they're mortified. Uh, like, you know, you think about, from their perspective. Oh, yeah. And there are people who say that they're partially at fault for raising a, a psychopath. I, I couldn't comment on that. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's talk stocks. <laughs> Best start to a year since 2019. Yeah. Should I start buying puts right now? <laughs> how do you how do you think about the big picture before we drill down? You know, because I, I deal in equities and mostly large cap equities all day long. Yeah. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of places I can go, right? I, this, is, <laughs> this is all I can do. But uh, what I can tell you is what feel, does it feel expensive or not. And it does. Everything feels pretty expensive Just right start now. buying regional banks. It'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> hey, well, I was having this conversation with one of our analysts today where we were talking about Costco, which is a fantastic business. We do not own. What was that Costco. 35 times? 44 oh, times. That's nifty 50-esque. And it's it's a 10% grower. You know, yeah. like it's a wonderful business. We think yeah. it's fantastic, but you're going to, you're going to pay 44 times. You know what, you know what kind of multiple has, we, we think about expected returns and, you know, how much growth are we going to get in the next five years? What kind of multiple would have to sustain? Well, what is the buyer now? of that thinking then? I, uh, besides the index fund, what is the active manager who's overweight Costco relative to the index? I wish I could tell well, you. Well, it's only they 30 like times 2027 20, earnings. Maybe that's it. I don't know. They it, like the reliability. Co you're not going to embarrass okay. yourself in Costco. Okay. But you can, if for, for every one of those two, we have like a, like a Zoetis, right? Which makes animal pharmaceuticals. Yeah. They, they dominate that industry. That is one that we own. It also Pfizer feel, spinoff. Yeah, Pfizer yeah. spinoff years ago. It's it's a wonderful business. It trades at a high 20s multiple, 28, 29 times earnings, which I would say is about reasonable. That's nice. It's a nice multiple. It's not too high, not too low. It's going to grow faster than a Costco. It's But there's yeah, no I, real comparison there for uh, a manager who is looking for names in a certain sector. Well, if that's they're the not way they do those it, two. right? Maybe that's what it is. Maybe the, you're there's not just, there's by just that. so much crap. No, no, we have a our portfolio is a highly concentrated portfolio. We have 23 companies in the portfolio today. You know, we we've always had between 20 and 25 companies basically. Do you have somebody telling you you need to own one consumer discretionary no. by Costco or by Target, or no. nobody's doing that with no, you? No, no, no. We so we go wherever we think the best companies are. So I love this chart. I grabbed this from Michael Mobison. It's a distribution of forward price to earnings ratio for the SP 500. And for the listeners, it shows, all right, there's a couple of stocks trading for less than five times, a few mm -hmm. more trading between five and 20. And the bulk of the, the highest number of companies, the, the bucket that they fall into it's between 10 and 15 times and 15 and 20 times. So everybody talks about how the market is expensive, but I think this does a really nice job showing where we are. Yeah. What bucket are you most likely to play in? So yeah, I, we we are most likely in the higher buckets, right? Because we're dealing with companies that have pristine balance sheets, tremendous competitive advantages. Higher multiple bucket. Yeah, higher multiple. Because that's because where the best companies are. They deserve are. premiums. Yeah. These are premium brands. Yeah. These are, these are companies that have mid-teens or better consistent earnings growth over time. They tend to dominate industries. They, they're going to grow for decades, essentially. And they have, no, they have no debt on their balance sheet, tons of free cash flow. This is what we, we spend all of our time on. So well, that's been the right place for yeah, the last for, few yeah, years. Yeah, well, it's been the right place for 30 years. So we've yeah, been doing it 35 true. years. But, but 
you get to some points in time where things feel like they're a little expensive. Now, I think if you're looking at this chart, it doesn't look like that, but it's because it's a smaller group of very large companies that's pulling up the market. Like in, in my opinion, a company like Apple is very, very expensive, right? It's trading at 30 times earnings. It is not growing. Apple has not grown in two years. Yeah, right? we're, we're going to do that later in but, the show. But for I sure. feel but, like just looking at this bucket, I would, I kind of, I'm a little bit surprised. I guess I would have ex expected it to be more of a skew to the right. Well, first it's the S&P 500, yeah. right? So it's a, it is a pretty broad yeah. universe. It, it, if you look at it on a, um, on a cap weighted basis, it would be sure. a lot more skewed oh, yeah, yeah. to the right. Uh, but it, it, there's also a lot of bad companies in the S and P 500 that don't. I was going to ask you like what that. are the what are the stocks in the five to ten times earnings? Financials. Uh, those are all <laughs> it's banks. Got to be regional banks. Well, mostly, 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 mostly banks. So, so let me set the table. The S and P 500 total return as of today uh, for Q1. Um, so effectively in the books, up ten and a half percent. Top three sectors on the year. A little bit of a surprise. XLE up 13%. It's energy. Mm -hmm. Communications up 12.6. Thank you, uh, Alphabet and Meta <laughs> uh, and Netflix. Um, XLF, third best sector, financials, up 12.25%. Most of the heavy lifting insurance companies up until the last couple of weeks when the big banks came alive. Mm, Here's sense. your bottom three. Mm -hmm. uh, not a surprise. XLRE, real estate sector, negative 0.65%. XLY, consumer discretionary, only up 3.42%. Mm -hmm. XLU, utilities, only up almost 4%. Yeah, kind of so, makes some sense, right? But you, got, but you got a horse race now. It's not yeah. tech, 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 tech. Tech's not even in the top three. Well, yeah, now it's just NVIDIA's tech, right? NVIDIA's all by itself right. in right. tech land, and then everything else is kind of more normal. Do you like a tape like this better than 2023, though, for what you do? Honestly, I don't really care, you know, because right. we're, we're doing it. Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean by that is it, any any environment changes very quickly, right? right? So we have a very long-term time horizon, right? The portfolio, I, I've been running it now for 16, 17 years, and Poland Capital has had this portfolio for 35 years. We think in like five and 10-year time horizon. So we know whatever's working now is probably not going to be next year. Yeah. What we're trying to do is dial in the portfolio's earnings growth. So we're not really targeting returns. We're targeting portfolio weighted average earnings growth. And if we can get that to maintain a mid-teens rate and just be careful not to pay too high multiples for any of the individual companies, the returns tend to track the earnings growth over time. Okay. And that works for indexes too, by the way. I'm glad you said that. This is this. There's not like this gigantic disconnect between the economy and the markets. And yeah, the markets are maybe, maybe you could say, not maybe, you can definitely say there's some froth. Yeah. Uh, things seem to be a little bit extended in the short term, fine. Yeah. But today we learned that the fourth quarter GDP was revised up to 3.4%. Yeah. Uh, current dollar GDP increased 5.1% at an annual rate or $346 billion. Yeah. That's just the increase yeah. in the fourth quarter to a level of $28 trillion. Yeah. Kathy Jones has dropped tweeted this morning. This is also from the, from the BEA release. Corporate profits rose to a new all-time high in Q4 of 2023. What should the market be doing? Yeah, I, I agree with you. Th things have been a lot stronger than I think everybody predicted. I, last year, everybody thought the recession was inevitable. It never really happened. Like, we're in a fairly good place. And what, when we look, we have some pretty good view on the economy when we look through some of our companies, so we we own Visa and MasterCard, we own Amazon, we own Nike, we own businesses that are real world, you know, good read on the consumer, especially because that's the most of the economy. And all of them are saying, you know, relatively strong, right? Visa and MasterCard spending, you can see it quite clearly. Even even though it's slowing a little bit, it's still pretty good growth. I mean, doesn't this look sort of like the, the stock market? It's a chart of <laughs> U.S. corporate profits. Yeah. It, the market is not disconnected from reality. No, but the, and the funny thing is, though, if you were to trace that profit chart to the individual companies, it'll explain the skew in market cap PEs as well, because most of that increase in profits is coming from a relatively small group of companies. Top, top 100 stocks. Yeah, it's probably top 20. John, really. put this uh, S&P price earnings next 12 months. This is the forward PE. It's at 21. This is from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, mm -hmm. So Michael's chart is not – is it, it, nobody is surprised that that's what corporate profits look like. And from my perspective, that's why PEs are creeping higher because profitability is like – it's like 
the right thing to be betting on right now. Yeah, I, but I wonder, is is that why? Or is it, you know, everybody's super excited about rate cuts coming and think that that's- Or AI. It's both of those things. case of it's NVIDIA. But I, my it's question, you guys know more about this than I do. My question on, on rate cuts was, does it even matter for equities? Because- the, the equities are really valued off of where the ten year is, not where it only the matters if the, it, it only matters if there's a huge need to roll debt in the next eighteen months amongst the top three hundred companies a, in America, and there isn't. Right, but if you're thinking about like a risk free rate, right, for for equities, you know, and I, we don't do discounted cash flow models with like you know BS academia stuff behind it. But if you're pricing risk assets off of a risk free rate with some long duration to it, you'd probably be looking at the 10 year more than you're looking at the Fed funds rate, right? Yeah. So, so if it's the, at 4.2. 4. Right. And if the Fed, you know, cuts three times, six times, whatever they're going to do, is the 10 year really coming down? I, I, I don't think. From these levels, how could it? Yeah, I don't think so, right? So why would equities be rallying? But everything I hear about, you know, that 21 multiple is because rate cuts are coming. Uh, yeah, there might be some of that. I, I, I think I also think it's a composition question. Mm -hmm. What are the biggest stocks in the index? Mm -hmm. And they're Apple and Microsoft, yeah. and they're not going to sell at twelve times earnings yeah. right now, um, which is kind of amazing, by the way, because we we owned Apple from two thousand nine, the very beginning of two thousand nine, to the end of twenty sixteen, which was a really good period. It was like a year and a half into the first iPhone, maybe, and you know for a long period. And and when we sold it in twenty sixteen, from that whole period, two thousand nine to twenty sixteen. The PE multiple was never above 15. You also had to hold time. it through the death of Steve Jobs, which yes. a lot of people were not willing to do. It was yeah. a hardware company. That's how it was valued. Because everybody thought yeah. eventually, right, it's some, it's someone would compete well, with them. Well, they said, look, the magic man is gone. Yeah. Now what? Yeah. It's the COO is in charge? Yeah. And you're going to bet on visionary technology? Right. Wrong. Which, by the way, they still have never brought any visionary technology since then, but it doesn't seem to matter. No no problem. But now the really company is in, not, in market cap. Right, right, right. But right. now the company's not growing. And it's trading at 30 times earnings. So I, it's hard for me to explain that. I don't really have a good a good view on why that is, other than it's a, it's considered now like a uh, almost like a utility, almost a, a consumer staple. I was going to say luxury goods. Yeah, and but is it is it considered luxury? Yes. You think? Well, there here's here's a test. Mm -hmm. What kind of phone do you have? <laughs> an iPhone. Okay. Yeah. What if I told you here's a here's a thousand dollars. Uh, you could go buy yourself a free phone. It could be anything but an iPhone. Yeah, right. You're, you're not buying it. Yeah, I tried. I tried to untether myself from the. What ecosystem. if I say here's ten thousand? Here's ten thousand dollars. Warren Buffett did this yeah. uh, exercise. Yeah. Here's ten thousand dollars. No strings attached. Except you can never buy another Apple product again. Okay, but but tell me that this is a like a simple question. But that's why it's a luxury good. That's all I'm saying. Okay, say it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Luxury goods pre-financial crisis, luxury companies. So I had an LVMH and Hermes or, yeah. you know, you name it. Most of the good luxury companies are European ones. They didn't trade at these multiples pre-financial crisis. As they weren't as powerful as they are they now. Also, they didn't have a 30% break on everything on the, on the app store. Okay, but they but but Apple's not growing even with that rake. Even with even with Google paying them eighteen billion dollars a year and growing to be the default search engine. So LVMH was selling to a potential customer base of maybe globally five million people. Right, it's a smaller. Base. And now it's a billion people. Yeah, there's an emerging middle class in places like Singapore and South Korea. They didn't exist. So arguably, LVMH's TAM. Yeah. Has absolutely exploded in the last 25 years. Sure. Which means yeah. the multiple that you would pay for a luxury goods retailer 25 years ago is not relevant to how how big these companies are today. Okay, I, I buy That's that. All I, would say. I buy that. But if you look at an LVMH, they, they still have wide open addressable market opportunity. Apple does not. True. Vision right? Pro? <laughs> yeah. What if everybody, what if everybody uh, wants to wear a watch on both wrists? <laughs> you know, by the way, years ago, today this is obviously still true, but even years ago, uh, if you looked outside the iPhone, Mac, iPad, Apple Watch, AirPods, Air, AirPods yeah. each one of those by themselves would be a Fortune one, Fortune 500 oh, yeah. company. Wow. Like, that's how, yeah. But none of them move the needle yeah. inside yeah. of Apple. So just getting back to the state of just things in general yeah. and how the economy and market are, are entangled. Yeah. This morning, we got news. Las Vegas Strip gambling revenue rose 12.4% year over year. That doesn't happen if things aren't pretty, pretty okay. <laughs> yeah, It's agreed. like the last place you spend money. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I, I, we are seeing that overall spending is still very, very strong. Uh, we are starting to see consumers make some choices, though. It's not broadly strong anymore. Like, it, it, you can see that people- Mikey caught a, caught, caught a strap now. Yeah. 
So we are seeing a little bit of concern on, uh, actually it's on the lower price footwear. So footwear below $100. We're seeing consumers are a little bit stretched. If there's not something really new or highly discounted, they're not buying it. The affluent buyers who are in the over $100 price point, still strong. We saw companies like Align Technology, which we own, which makes the Invisalign clear aligners. They're going through a really tough period right now. That's a five to $8,000, very discretionary product, mostly for adults. So we are seeing people pick and choose. They're still spending money on their vacations, their holidays, their Airbnbs. Like they're they're still spending money on travel, but they're being very selective now on what products. Delta, the cruises, both just have the same thing, like record. Yeah. yeah. Records. Yeah, travel is still, I mean, I think that that COVID, you know, where we, we were locked down for so long where we couldn't travel, people are saying, I'm not doing I thought that, that was going to wear off like two years ago. I, I thought there'd be a lull. Like we'd have this no. like balloon and lull. But, no. and now, but not yeah. only that, not only that, they said because of Zoom, Mm -hmm. Corporate travel was not ever going to come yeah. back. I it bought is that. Through, yeah. It is. I did too. It is through the roof. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they cannot believe they cannot believe the demand for corporate uh, events. Yeah, I mean, I'm a testament to that. I, I travel more today than I did pre-COVID. Yeah, you know, I think that's. I think that's yeah, true. and people are people are saying yes to more things than they did previously. Yeah, because now it, it's it, now it's like an experience that you look forward to. And you can tack on, even a work trip, you can tack onto it and still work remote, right? And still, you know, Airbnb talks about this all the time <clears throat> where you have these kind of combined, you know, work and leisure things because you can plug in from anywhere. You can, you know, your family could be off in a theme park and you're in your room. Oh, the, that's, a, that's a huge part of this mm -hmm. uh, where business travel and, and personal travel are blending together. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so, so a lot of things, so... I would just say like where you see some of the big bifurcation mm -hmm. is the high end versus the low end. Yeah. So if we say the high end is the top 10% of income earning households, mm -hmm. there's zero evidence that anyone is slowing down on anything. No. And they're more resilient an, anyway. Right. Yeah. Up to and including whatever the credit card companies are saying. Mm -hmm. The guy from uh, RH mm -hmm. uh, who <laughs> loves to talk, uh, <laughs> listening, Gary Friedman. Okay. Uh, he had a lot to say about that market. Started he's, to he's, get, he's been bearish. He's been bearish because of what interest rates are doing to mortgages, but he's like, you know what? Actually, we're doing pretty good. But Dan, when so. you see something like this, so this is Discover Financial Services. Is yeah. anything more sensitive to the consumer? And you look at uh, well, they just got acquired. Yeah, I know, but acquired. fine, but fine. Look at the acquirer. Wait, is Capital One buying them? Yes. Yeah. Right. So Capital One too. Yeah. These like I I always default to when I think the market is looking a little bit frothy or stretch or whatever, and I, yeah. and I still think that the market's not dumb. No, and to your point, credit quality is not bad. Like, Either right, you know, consumers are, you know, they're yes, their their leverage is going up, but the, the bank delinquencies are not very high, charge offs are not very high because people are still working. That's it, right? Well, when you listen to these calls of v, you mentioned Visa, Mastercard, yeah. they're all saying the same thing. Yeah. Well, as long as, long as we know this, right? Americans spend money, right? As long as they're working, they spend. They spend. Money. Yeah. So unemployment is still extraordinarily low, and yeah. in, until you see, and, and I think companies are also a little bit careful about laying people off. Because remember, a lot of them got caught a little bit during COVID when all of a sudden they needed to hire back people and not everybody wanted to go back to work. There are no net layoffs. Next Friday on April 5th, uh, we're going to get March non-farm payrolls. The consensus is like plus 216,000. Yeah. Even if it misses by 50%, that's still 100,000 more people with jobs, jobs than the prior month. Yeah. Um, let's go through your top 10 holdings. Mm -hmm. I will criticize each. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this as of the, as of the end of uh, December. Yeah. yeah. So, so like, obviously, whatever standard disclaimers normally apply to yeah. fund managers, just, like, pretend I said all those magic words. <laughs> Amazon is 14.78% of your portfolio. So when you say high conviction, that's what you're talking about, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Microsoft is 9%, and they are growing in a way that Apple isn't. Correct. But are they growing that that quickly at this stage in the game outside of? You'd, uh, you'd be surprised. Yeah. I yeah? mean, it's right. for an extremely large company. We still think it's a low to mid teens earnings grower. It's incredible. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And by the way, it's trading at the same multiple as Apple, which isn't growing. Which is also incredible. Yeah. Uh, Alphabet, 7%. Yeah. Okay. Where are you finding these companies? It's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> They're secrets, right? They're like, no, but wait, but there's two things that are uh, very much noticeably gone. No NVIDIA, no Apple. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, ServiceNow. What's the story on ServiceNow? Uh, For, let's pretend- It's the best software somebody, company that most people don't know anything Somebody has no about. idea. Why is that your fourth biggest We keep holding? hearing about them with AI, with respect to AI. Yeah, they're, they're, it's a little early in AI, but it's a very, it's a, it's a good use case. So ServiceNow basically is a software platform that allows you to automate pretty much anything. So like if you were previously doing things through email or spreadsheet- Enterprise. Or, 
Yeah, it's enterprise software, right. uh, and it's mostly used, like I said, for things that were inefficiently done in the past. So for like at Poland Capital, if you wanted to open up an account with us, you know, there's a whole bunch of workflows that would happen when someone would send an email like, hey, I want to open up an account. Someone would email this and that and whatever, kick off a bunch of paperwork and workflows. Yeah. We've now standardized on the ServiceNow platform. So oh, you're a customer, Yeah, too. we're also a customer. Uh -huh. we, our okay. investment team brought it to our IT team. But, okay, very uh, cool. But we 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 end up now, everything gets automated. So once that, that first in, inbound comes in saying we're going to open up an account, it automates to kick off workflows that are all digital and all audited so that you can't make a mistake. So if something's filled out wrong, it'll, it'll stop you from doing it. So it, okay. it makes it highly efficient less prone to error. And you could do this across any company. Who, but who, like whose business did they take coming on the scene and yeah. getting as big as they, was that historically Salesforce or no. Oracle? I'm trying to think. Like, there was who, almost nothing. It was stuff that you were- It was like, like post-it notes, it was, right? Yeah, it was it was emails, spreadsheets. It was something inefficient. It was something that it wasn't designed to do. $160 billion market cap. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And it's growing. It's been growing very consistently in the 20 to 25 Now, the founder range. of that is now the CEO of something else? Well, he was the-, the he was, not the founder, the second CEO who scaled who really built it. Service Now, what became the CEO of Snowflake, which is why we, people were. But then he's gone now. He just left. Yeah, Slootman. He just, uh, yes, Slootman. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, Adobe not having a good not having a good couple of weeks, but obviously an incredible company. Yeah, that gets brought up in the AI conversation all the time, but in yeah. a negative sense lately. Well, we yeah. So we, uh, this Adobe position you're seeing here, six percent. It's not. It's it's half that now. We had trimmed it. Okay. Um, because one uh, Adobe's a fantastic company, like for Stipulated. content creation, we, we all agree. amazing, right? It's been it's a monopoly. Basically. We use them to make this show. I bet. So, yeah, 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 I'm sure. Uh, originally, they got some AI positive hype because they'd come out with a product called Firefly, which was essentially their Gen AI text to video, text to picture type, uh, t uh, text to image. And so when everybody was worried that uh, you know generative AI is really going to hurt. Adobe, Firefly was like, oh, okay, no, they got a product for that, so they're going to be okay. So that was about a year ago, and the stock started to really go with the AI hype. Now, we see a very balanced risk reward when it comes to Gen AI with uh, with Adobe. There are risks, you know, there are some real open products today that do kind of low end stuff that Adobe can do. So we are a little concerned about that, but they do have this great product as well. So we thought it was kind of a balanced risk reward, but then with the valuation kind of ripping, we just said, all right, time to pull it back. So and the small. expectations with that valuation get, yeah, get ratcheted much. up. Yeah, because it, there is risk. It's not without risk. When you saw that video, uh, was it Sora with the dogs running in the snow? Yeah, yeah. That knocked Adobe stock down, I think. Yeah, it, right. Because the thought process is if you can capably create these things very easily without paying a license. Just or writing text into a box. Yeah, that's a, definitely a negative for them, right? Yeah. But the reality is for most professionals – even if you start with a, an open Gen AI product like that, you're probably going to still have to pull it into Adobe Tools to edit and make it exactly you know what it's going to be for. So there, I do believe it's probably a net positive, but we were open minded enough to say it might not be a hundred percent positive. So let's keep a smaller, smaller weight. We did the same thing with Alphabet actually because you know Google's got very similar type risks. Same way. Like you, know, you don't know so, if they're going to dominate or if this yeah. is going to be the thing that takes them down. Well, and for, for Google, even if they still win, right, even if their AI is better than, you know, chat GPT and everything open. They won't have 90% market share like they do in search. But even if they did, is it going to be as monetizable as search, which uh, is extremely monetizable, yeah. right? So that's the question. So we've, again, reduced our position there. We still love the companies. We still own a lot of them, but you know, taking them down and we've been reallocating, this is uh, slightly dated. So we have, we've been reallocating to companies that have been kind of left behind because there's no AI story to them. So okay. Thermo Fisher, Nike, even though, yeah. even though current results of Nike are not that great, we see a real positive setup for Nike coming. Uh, companies like Zoetis, you know, where we, these are companies that are typically great compounders, mid-teens compounders, but, you know, don't have an AI component to them. Yet. Yet, <laughs> yeah. Don't have the hype around them. Right. So they've kind of fallen behind. I I'm, like that idea. I've been doing the same thing. Yeah. So I, I agree with that. I'm curious how, how you guys think about Netflix, which is a company, yeah. the stock that I own. Yeah. It's a company that has been through three cycles over the last five years, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. During the pandemic, everybody was chasing them. Finally, the, the legacy media companies got wise that maybe we need a streaming company. Obviously, yeah. they were way too late. Yeah. And like, Wiley Coyote, they chased Netflix yeah. off a cliff. Yeah. <laughs> Netflix plummeted, and they said, "All right, time to get serious. Uh, we've got all we've got all these people that are just freeloading. Let's let's cut that out. Let's maybe add, add in some advertising." Yeah. 
Have you owned the stock the entire time? We've owned it since 2000. So oh, we, wow. we bought it oh my God. right around. Hit that. What's your, what's your, <laughs> wait, what's your cost base? Well, I, it, honestly, we've traded it so much now. I honestly don't know <laughs> the cost base. We're in a good place on our cost that, base. Talk but, about a compounder. I think that's one of the greatest compounders in the history of history. It is. And, but I'll tell you what, we didn't own it before that because it was highly levered with no free cash flow. Right? Before that, when did it come but, public? It came public, you know, 10 years before that. When it was right? shipping DVDs. Well, no, no, no. Even the streaming. When they started to build their own stream. Remember, they were first, before they had DVDs. And then after DVDs, it was streaming of other people's content. They weren't creating their well, own content. They did content. a licensing deal with Disney. And Disney yeah. arguably built Netflix by accident. Correct. Yeah, they were they were just distributing anybody it's else's content. They were the only streamer that had right. Winnie the Pooh. Huh? Yeah, did you miss me? Because it said Netflix IPO in 2002. Did he say nine? He said 2000. Oh, 2000. I'm sorry. So yeah, it was okay. even a lot farther. Yeah, I didn't mean to speak. Okay. So yeah, it, it had built, built itself though, highly levered, right? So it was, it, first it was through distributing those DVDs and distributing other people's content, but you have to pay to be able to do that. And then they decided to make their own content, which really costs a lot of money. House right? of Cards was, I think, like yeah. the, the thing they did first that like caught fire. Yeah. And then they probably- Orange is a new block after that. I yeah, think. they probably internally said like, all right, like big f-ing deal. Give Kevin, give uh, uh, what's his name, Kevin Spacey, yeah. three million dollars, yeah. and we could do what we're paying for. Right. So they did, and they did it in a big way. But in order to yeah. do that, they had to take out a lot of debt to be able to do it. There right. was really no free cash flow. In 2020 was the really when they, but right before COVID, they started to actually go free cash flow positive. Yeah. Everything started to look good. That's when we then we started to purchase, and of course, COVID was a nice boom for them. A lot of new subscribers, and the fact that they couldn't really make any content at that time meant their content costs came down. So their free cash flow started to, to pile up. One of the up. other things that happened along the way was they scared everyone with the international push. Mm-hmm. It ended up being the right thing. Mm-hmm. It was hugely expensive yeah. to go into Europe and Asia yeah. and Latin America and not just go in yeah. with American movies, but locally produce. Yeah. And now three quarters of their subscribers are outside the U S right. And, but and also the cross pollination of international other shows content. in other countries. Yeah. And their content does translate across borders, which is pretty amazing too. But you know, to your point, Michael, when, when they all of a sudden, right after COVID, they said, Oh, by the way, we lost subscribers. No, they didn't. Well, they lost yeah. like a couple yeah. a, a million or two, but right? that shocked the street. That, that shocked. But then at the same time they said, Oh, and by the way, there's a hundred million homes that use Netflix that don't pay for it. That was a shockingly large number. We've been trying to, to find that number for a long time. Oh, it's really? a really hard number to find because it, it gets to the addressable market, right? Yeah. We thought the addressable market was about 400 million homes. We thought they had a little under 200 million, so they're only about halfway there. But if you have 100 million that are just not paying for it, that means you're three quarters of the way there and you haven't convinced some of those people to pay for it. So you're you're running up against uh, you know saturation of your addressable market and maybe not able to monetize it. So that changed, and that's why the stock sold off so hard at that time. We kind of hit the pause button at that time. It was the first time in my career that we've had a thesis changing event where we decided to not sell right away. That we just said, "Hold on, this is let's see, let's see if it's the spring well, of twenty one. Yeah, when it blows up on that's when I bought it. Right. Okay, well, that's a great purchase. Well, time. it yeah. went down another seventy points first. <laughs> okay, but I, I bought that blow up. For, I was on vacation. I was in Anguilla and I saw it on the boat. And I just oh, I saw, I'm a points guy. I don't care about percentages. <laughs> I saw Netflix go from six hundred to two hundred. Yeah. Or, or 300, I said, I might be early. I don't give a shit. 300 yeah. points down is enough for me. Yeah, and you were right. I mean, the, the, for us, we needed to understand, like, how are they going to monetize these users? Where, you know, where are they first? Because, you know, monetizing an, uh, a shared password in the U.S. is a lot easier than in Peru. Okay, so you just have to be, figure out where are these people? How are they going to target them? If they won't pay $15, would they pay six and watch some ads? And the well, answer that, was yes. Yeah, and, and, and it, that's more profitable for them. Yeah, right? the ads, the ads at, right now, they're probably about even with what a regular subscription is. But over time, we think the, the cost per impression is going to be a lot higher. Let me tell time. you a question. Did you know that when they wanted to build the ad supported, yeah. they went directly to Microsoft? Yeah. And in an earlier generation, that's exactly what Mark Zuckerberg did. Microsoft built Meta's whole advertising business in that window between basically filing an S1 and going like- You mean when they went mobile? You're talking about the mobile transition? Microsoft built the ad thing with- Oh, interesting. uh, Yeah, with uh, Zuckerberg. He didn't like build this thing by himself. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know that. Uh, but but by I the knew way, Netflix was serious when they said our partner is going to be Microsoft. Well, it's interesting because when they went with Microsoft, they Microsoft had just bought a company that does connected TV ads, and so it was kind of 
it was an existing company, but it was a very small company. We were very surprised that they went with that with yeah. Microsoft. Who's the competitor you're saying? No, not because of, yes, but not just because of that, because it was a, it's a small player. You know, yeah. Microsoft is a very small player in this space. So, you know, and, and I think maybe that's the reason why it's been slow to roll out. Well, it's also it's way it. less of a competitor than Amazon or Google. Yeah, but you have like Trade Desk as a potential right. partner. There's a few others that are like in the space that are more. People said they were gonna buy Roku. That was yeah, like a rumor. I didn't, I didn't I think that was that. gonna Did happen. It, they they, they uh, invented Roku, right? Like they spun it out way, just, way, 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 way back in the right day. about that. Yeah. Um, Nobody buys Roku stock unless they've been drinking. <laughs> so Netflix has obviously been incredibly uh the, the, the turnaround has been incredible. Yeah. But you you uh you think the low hanging you wrote the low hanging fruit may already have been picked on yeah. password sharing efforts. Yeah. So I'm curious. I think uh so. So my opinion, and I'm literally making this up, is that this could be a trillion dollar company. I don't know how long it takes to get there, could be. but they're complete. I mean, obviously they're the winner, yeah. and they're completely the only gonna, profitable one. They're com cable. Yeah. It, it's like mutual funds and ETFs, right? It's only yeah. going in one direction. Yeah. The Jake Paul fight's going to be huge. Um, yeah, I just think true. there's a lot more runway ahead of them. You guys trimmed yeah. your position. Why? Yeah, really only on valuation. Uh, so we had added to it down at that point when we finished our due diligence on how they were going to monetize those shared passwords. Uh, we felt very positive. In fact, at the time, uh, we felt that they were going to quintuple their free cash flow just from uh, monetizing 30% of shared passwords that they'd be able to increase their free cash flow fivefold. And that's exactly what happened, even though they didn't actually monetize a third of it yet. They've probably only done about 15%. But the market is has gotten smart on this. Like the market finally gets it. But, you know, back at that time, we doubled our position when it was trading at 17, 18 times earnings similar to the time that you were adding to it or buying it. And um, now it, when we trimmed it, it was about 36, 37 times earnings. So it's it's not that all the fruit has been picked. Yeah. It's just the low hanging fruit. Has been I picked. have this theory. I hate myself that I'm not in it right now. <laughs> I have this theory that there's a, there's like a, a rights offering for, you know, the NBA comes up again oh, you think and so? there's 20 different companies pretending to be competing and then Netflix comes in like over, like off from the top rope with a crazy number. I hope you're wrong about Wait that. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> and the stock rallies on that news. If it does, uh, I'm out uh, entirely. Because think of this signal, but think of the signaling that that economic. would be. I don't know. I if, think they those... out, if they outbid YouTube, right? Well, it would just say that they're the gorilla, but I, I don't think it's It would it's say how rally. serious they are about live content and sports. But I like how disciplined they'd be on, they, they're being on okay. live sports. I, right. I really do. I mean, they've really only done F1. The raw deal was pretty huge. Yeah. I mean, That's but, but relative to the size yeah. of like NBA, I think, NFL. I think the raw deal was bigger in what it signals than in terms of the dollar amount. But they yes. can't get the NBA. Yes. They can't get NBA, NFL. They can get Monday night. They could get- Yeah, they could do what, what Amazon's doing. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Get, Nobody's getting all of either. I, I, you have to just think about the risk reward of those things because they're generating a lot of good free cash flow right now by not doing those things, by by blocking and tackling, by just having great content where you always want to come back and see what's new and what's different. You know, getting sports doesn't necessarily mean you have to do so it. Is Turner way. choking on the NBA deals or is I, that keeping them afloat? I don't, I don't know because I haven't looked at the economics yeah. of the deal for them in, individually, but I, I just think those big deals – those tent poles are just not, yeah. not necessarily. Can we go that. back. Can we go back to this chart? Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, John. Average large cap mutual fund is six hundred seventy-two basis points. Underweight, the magnificent seven. This is <laughs> as of the end of twenty twenty-three. I assume it's still somewhat I kind, accurate. I kind of wish yeah. Nvidia and Tesla were stripped out of this because I feel like explain. It's, it's explain such a. What it's we're such a at. All right, so let me, can I just give you like, ahead, my opinions please. on the Mag Seven because I, I get asked about this like every meeting that I do because we don't own. Half of them. Tesla, NVIDIA, Apple. Right. It's such bullshit. Okay. So like the the idea of- What is? Grouping them? Yeah, call, yeah, naming them. Uh, you know, we had this with, uh, what, what did they call them before? Fangs. 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 Yeah. The then fang. it was Fan Mag. Yeah. yeah. Why, why are those, why are those because seven? I'll, I'll give you the answer. Uh -huh. Because they are tech, they might not all be in the tech sector. They are tech giants yeah. with- Historically, tech enabled, let's say anyway, huge revenue growth, huge profit margins, hugely popular, famous uh, people running them, that's, and that's amazing it. stock prices. Okay, that's why I hear. So you. that's but it. when I look at those seven companies, what I see are companies with entirely different business models. Agreed. That are in entirely different industries. Sometimes <laughs> that have wildly different growth rates, wildly True. different profitability, and wildly different valuations. So to me, none they don't go together at all. If you wanted to talk about, okay, other other fast-growing companies that are like that, why is Eli Lilly not up there? Eli Lilly's 
obesity drug is going to be larger than NVIDIA's GPU business at some point. So like, why, you know, why is Lily not in that group? Wait, you think so? Yeah, I do. I, we can get to that okay. if you want. But, Lily, Lily but might, I, might go into that group. But I'm just saying like it, it, these arbitrary, you know, groupings that then ETFs are created. No, you're right. Eli will everything. never be lumped in with this group. No, it just won't be. No. Dan, what if we say, yeah. what if we say what all seven of them have in common yeah. is that uh, they are the biggest winners as a result of cloud computing? Because that's really the driver of all the earnings here. It's Azure, it's Amazon Web Services. Well, three of those companies, I would say yes to. Maybe Tesla is the odd man out, but Nvidia. There is no Nvidia if there's not a. Cl I mean a Apple. Cloud. Uh, yeah, I mean you could. I guess tangentially, there's a cloud of something related to them, okay. but like. You know, cloud services, yes, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, right? They have like these platforms. That That's the have, driver like, of the earnings. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For those three companies, yeah. those are, those are well, Google, not really, but the, for the, for uh, Microsoft. All right, so and two Amazon. out of seven is not bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but Duncan, I mean, edit all this shit out. <laughs> hey, Poland Capitals, uh, you know, all, all of our infrastructure is on the cloud. Can we get yeah, lumped in, too. Lumped in we with that? Yeah, us too. Mag 8, <laughs> Mag 9. <laughs> all right, I like it. No, so, but my point is yeah. it's a, these artificial creations, which is a market thing, right? We all know that these things get created by somebody. It's good news stories and, and whatever. But the point of it is, you know, if you're looking to invest smartly in, in individual securities, you really have to look at each one individually, not as a group, right? Which is obvious. I agree. But that, when, when yeah, we look ahead. at them, we see completely different investment theses behind them and wildly different potential returns. Last thing on the Netflix thing before we move sure, off of yeah. streaming. Yesterday, Paramount was cut to junk by S&P. Mm. Stock didn't move, which I thought was kind of interesting. Mm. Uh, maybe tell us I where think sentiment is on that event one. It's this point. Yeah, I don't yeah. know that company that yeah. well, obviously. But uh, I, I would say it's probably that people weren't surprised that it is. Well, exactly. <laughs> it but is. do you think the other streamers at this point could do anything? In other words, if yeah. you were – if you had, well, you do on Netflix. If, if, if Warner Brothers and Paramount or whoever, whoever did something, would that, would that impact your thesis at all? Um, at the moment, probably not. But I, I think what they all could do is figure out how not to be all things to all people, right? I think Netflix is the only one that's kind of surfed out far enough yeah. that they can kind of be all things to all people. Amazon can kind of do it because it's part of their prime offerings, right? It's, and they have it's, MGM now. Right. Apple seems to be sort of uh, going into the Apple historical is literally thing. doing, but, but Apple's, literally doing nothing. They're doing nothing. They're literally yeah. like spending money. Have a very small subscriber base. Like they're really not doing it. Do you understand? The right way. They just spent three hundred million dollars on a World War II show. Yeah. If, let's assume somebody loves it and watches eight episodes of that. <laughs> what do you watch after? Right. Manhunt. No, honestly, there is <laughs> nothing there. It's f***ing crazy Although, how little yeah, they're doing. But it's also kind of funny because you end up with like a Ted Lasso with Apple, which is a, I mean, huge, that's a hit. huge yeah. event. And then nothing. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. Stay and tuned for Ted Lasso season three yeah. in two years. And and maybe it's, again, because Apple's so big that even having a Netflix-sized business inside of it is just not needed. I think moving. what they <laughs> thought, this is my guess, and yeah. I think Amazon to some extent, I think their idea was we're going to do just enough content yeah. That people are aware that we exist, yeah. but we're really going to be a portal to Max, to this service, to that service, yeah. and we're going to be like the central um, experience to everyone's apps. The problem is they don't have Netflix in there, right? Right. So you can't be the portal Which if you don't have the, the biggest part channel. Of, and that's part of the the the. Like the imagine Justice paying Department. for <laughs> imagine paying for cable, but like you can't get ESPN. Yeah. Nobody would do that. Yeah, I I think streaming is interesting to your to your point, Michael. Like, I think that everybody realizes now that it's really really expensive to do it right, and Netflix is the only one who. And and by the way, Netflix almost went bankrupt a few times along the way. Like it wasn't like a sure thing they were going to win when they were going on this spending spree. And I think right now, where investors really want profitability. From companies, it's hard for anybody to do what Netflix has already done. And so they're all starting to pull back on that. Disney's pulling back on it. Uh, you know, they're basically saying, all right, we need to get profitable. Disney had stopped giving any content to Netflix, and now they're relicensing some of their not, – not Disney Pixar content, but some of their other – content now back to Netflix. They all want to be profitable. So they all have to kind of figure out their niche. And and the, probably the end game is it ends up being like the cable cut. They put them all back yeah. together again. Yeah. yeah. It's so interesting. This is like a, one area where the macro really impacted these companies. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. the markets didn't care. Mm -hmm. Just grow. Lose money. Who cares? No, nobody was looking at it. Mm -hmm. Just grow the just grow your subscribers. Subscribers. That That's was it. it. They had yeah. activist investors telling them Dan Loeb at third point yeah. told told Disney. Yeah. Stop paying a dividend and triple down on streaming. Yeah. Like it is very rare that you will have activist investors tell a company to return less capital to yeah. shareholders. And that was yeah. the right advice at the time. Yeah. And it made sense. Yeah, yeah. It made sense at the time. Yeah. And he knows what he's talking about. He brought Sony back from the dead, basically. Yeah. 
as an as an activist. You know, Disney's so. Disney's got some incredible assets, but they also have a lot of crap. In we there do too. Uh, <laughs> we do Amazon. So this. <laughs> This is one of the last of the companies to get back to the 2021 high yeah. of that group. It's yeah. almost there. I'm long uh, Amazon. Same. Yeah. Uh, I just look at this company as invincible. I don't know why. I think so too. But it, invincible, but now with- <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, yeah. I, well, I, I mean, I, know, I, I, I think know you know why. why. I mean, it's got three amazing businesses in one. But you yeah. know what my thesis was? Yeah. If the new guy screws up, what's his name is coming back off the yacht. Well, I'll tell you what. The new guy- yeah, right. Uh, Jassy. <laughs> yeah, Andy Jassy. He's not a new guy. He's been at the I company that, for I'm a long saying, time, and he was, he's by the way the guy who built AWS. He was the guy who built AWS. So he's, no, he's the boss. He's legit. Right? Yeah, yeah. I think he gets a bad rap because of the timing at which he inherited Terrible the CEO time, not his role. Fault. Not his fault, right? You know, Jeff Bezos wanted to launch his rockets and do his thing, so like you know, he handed over the company right? after the pandemic. Yeah, right. remember what they did, right? They doubled the size of the company during the pandemic to handle the excess demand that they were getting. It went from a 20% growth business to a 40% growth business because everybody was at they hired home. a million people. Yeah, they, crazy. They, they ended up doubling the size of a massive distribution and logistics center and built a, uh, a truck fleet the size of FedEx or UPS at the same time. Yes. So, and but remember, Amazon's not got the margin structure of Google, right? Amazon's margin structure pre-COVID was 7% Profit margin, pre-tax profit margin. Well, all, all the profits were AWS for a long time, right? Like yeah. all of them. Uh, prime, yeah. prime membership. Prime plus, yeah, yeah prime plus, right. right. Now, when they decided to double everything, right, to handle all the excess demand, but then all of a sudden the world reopens and people start going back to stores, their growth went from 20 to 40 to zero. And then all of a sudden you have these massive diseconomies of scale in their retail business, right? So their retail profit margins went negative, deeply negative, hemorrhaging cash. And Andy Jassy inherits the company at that moment, right? Yeah. So it looks terrible. Now- Him and Chapek, poor guys. Yeah, but we, we said at the time, that they, look, we're, there's one thing that we know, people are gonna buy more stuff on Amazon. They'll get that scale back, right? And AWS was still humming. Their advertising business is absolutely unbelievable. It's the and third very, largest advertising business in the world now, I read. Yeah, it is, okay. it is. And Overnight. It, yeah, and, it, and, it's, and it's an amazing one. We can get into it in a second. Why I think that's actually one of the better advertising models out there. But- you have the retail business, which is, you know, let's call it zero profit Break margin. Even. Yeah. We think it could be a little higher, but it's going to be in the single digits. You have AWS, which is a 30% profit margin business. You have advertising, which is like a 70, 60 to 70% profit margin business. So our original thesis on Amazon was just, if those three businesses grow the way that they're going to grow, the highest margins ones are the fastest growing ones. You're going to end up having margins back to pre-COVID levels and then a lot higher over time, just from the mix benefit. Okay. But what Andy Jassy is doing and not getting any credit for it yet, but he will, is he's being extremely disciplined on a lot of the pet projects that, you know, were, were under the Bezos regime. They were throwing a lot of money. Bezos at a lot bought of MGM, yeah. right? Yeah. What were the but, pet projects like drones Well, yeah. <laughs> or same hour delivery? Oh, I heard the, that. Well, they're down, they the, already, they the actually fire, do that. The fire, the Alexa. Yeah, they're, yeah. Those, and those are still bullshit. there, but there's, there, there are, you know, chasing down opportunities, like they really want to do fresh grocery, right? That's why they bought Whole Foods. They originally wanted to figure out how they could get into fresh grocery. But they shrunk the Alexa a lot. They've shrunk a lot. Of, that's what the Angie Jassy has been doing. He's been shrinking these projects down and cutting out a lot. By the way, Amazon had hundreds of pet projects. Not all of them were big. And he's been cutting all of those. And he's been talking about very disciplined, only investing in businesses that are contiguous with the core, with the good ROI. This is a very different they also program. have to be huge, yeah, because to move the needle, yeah. they, right? Otherwise, what are we like? What are we doing? Right. Science fair. So, but if you look at it now, yeah, what you see is so when we added, we, we made Amazon that giant size position a little over a year ago when their profit margins were one point nine percent. That's where they bottomed out. Okay, and we said we can see them clearly getting back to pre COVID levels just from their mixed benefit, and if they do end up being disciplined on spending even higher. So we said, all right, 1.9, we think by the end of 2023, they could be back to about 6%. And they actually hit eight by the end of last year. So they're 8%, back- 8% profit margins. Pre-tax profit margins. Okay. So they're back to uh, just above the levels they were pre-COVID. Stock fell 56% or something. Like that. Yeah. It got killed. It got killed. Where do you think, it, do you have price targets for these things in your we don't, head? We or don't or use do you have targets. Evaluation? Well, right now it's trading at 25 times free cash flow. Which what is, should it be? It, that sounds uh, high. Well, I, I let it just stay there. Let it just stay there. But let the it's cash gonna, flow grow. Yeah, we see it compounding at 20 to 25% growth over the next five years. So we see the margins going from eight today to the mid to high could teens. This, could this join Apple and Microsoft and I guess NVIDIA 
as like just multi-trillion, yeah. like it's 1.75 trillion yeah, now. Yeah, I think it will. This yeah. could be three. I, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't have a giant size position. So no, I, so I, maybe I, Jassy like starts yeah. some credit. Jason? I, I, I think Jassy is honestly a superstar. We thought that before he was CEO. We've known him as the head of AWS. He's been you know at Amazon. He was like you know, employee number like 20 yeah. at Amazon. He's, he's so a, Jason Delray at Fortune wrote about their compact package today. Um, so they're they're not giving a lot of cash bonuses because a lot of their comp is based in stock and the stock is up 90% of the last year, yeah, yeah. which is great for them. Yeah. So Jason writes, the compensation update comes as Amazon leaders under, under Andy Jassy continue to look for ways to trim unnecessary costs and increase profitability yeah. while investing in growth areas such as generative AI. Uh, over the last couple of years, Amazon has laid off more than 27,000 corporate employees while he focuses on investing in fewer, bigger bets. Last quarter, they generated their largest operating profit ever, uh, $13.2 billion. Yeah, I mean, that's the story, right? I mean, that, and they are, they're running much more efficient. And I think one of the reasons why it trades at a discount to Apple, right, is it, whenever Amazon has gotten to margins about here, 7-ish, 8%, they go into another investment period, right, where they drive those margins back down again. That's what they did when they built AWS, which turned out to be a good one. You know, and people are just worried that they're going to just spend money on things like Grocery or, gen or, or generative AI, quite frankly. Or generative AI. That's going to not get a are. return. They're right? going to spend $2.75 billion into uh, Anthropic recently. Right, right. So they're, they are investing there, right? Yeah. But but they're they're actually getting good leverage on their capital expenditures. Is, it possible, is it possible, though, for them to commit the gravest sin? Let's say the second gravest sin is to invest too much. But for a tech giant, the gravest sin is to invest too little yeah. and lose. Yeah, I don't think is that I, a risk. Yeah, I don't think so because I I think what Amazon is doing, they are spending a lot of money in generative AI right now, not just in anthropic, but in, no, they're in, making chips. Yeah, they're, they're doing buying all GPUs. The they're making their own chips. Yep. They're investing very heavily. The the leverage that they're getting is it's replacing all of that investment that went into the retail business when they had to double the retail business. Well, now that investment has come way down. They're really optimizing. The distribution network, so it doesn't require that much capital. They built they built their own FedEx. They don't have to like yeah. keep buying have to keep doing that right at that rate. Yeah, okay. Exactly. So exactly. now they can buy GPUs instead. Yeah. Do we want to put this chart of Amazon's but, cloud on, computing empire? But, uh, sure, fine. Um, so Mayhem from Markets tweeted: Amazon's data center and office space square footage have doubled since 2020. The company will be spending an additional 150 billion dollars over the next 10 years as it bets on AI catalyzing the next cycle of growth in the cloud. Mm -hmm. This is a pretty wild chart. This is 40 million square feet in yeah. Amazon's cloud computing business. Yeah. That's data centers. Yeah. Now, not all of that is for AI. Obviously, they run. They run. Uh, Amazon Web Services is a data center business, right? It's a data center as a service business, essentially, for anyone who wants to run their infrastructure on AWS. So some of that is, and you can see that that more linear growth. Inflection. But yeah, that, so yeah. that's what I want to get to. So in 2015, so that the the listener has a reference, mm -hmm. they had eight million square feet, which yeah. probably seemed like a lot then. Yeah. Now it's 40 million, and it started to hockey stick around COVID. Yeah. Um, obviously. Like, well, I can't picture what 40 million square feet is. <laughs> and most of I. it is not for humans to walk through. Right. Most of it is like yeah. servers. Correct. Yeah. And things to cool servers. Correct. Yeah. Now, and not, it's still th mind boggling. And not all that, ho that hockey stick was all, there was a, an acceleration in cloud adoption during COVID. Of course. That, and that's why the hockey stick. That last little piece, you know, where you're starting to get into 2022 and 23, that's only where Gen AI would have come into the picture now. So you're not really seeing a massive increase on that chart that's coming from, from Gen AI. That's more from the cloud, the shift to the cloud. Let's do the uh, Apple antitrust story. Wait, hang on. Last, last thing, but just before we move off of Amazon, you said that you think that they may have the best revenue business in the world. Why do you say that? For, for advertising. Yeah. Yeah. The, the reason is because of when advertising happens, right? So if you're, um, if you're on Facebook or Instagram and you get an ad Right, that's that's a passive ad, right? You weren't you weren't out looking for something. It's just there, and it's, you're kind of it's a top of the funnel where you know you're just browsing. You know, you know, maybe a catalog. Guessing what you might want. Yeah, and and maybe they can lead you down the funnel, right? Uh, if you're doing a Google search, you're probably looking for something. You may have some intent to buy, so you're getting now more narrowly down the funnel. When you're on Amazon looking to buy something, you're a buyer. Yeah. You're, right you're on the bottom of the funnel, you're putting in a term, and then you're getting a sponsored listing right up top yeah. that's right in your face. That is a very monetizable uh, listing. You know, so you can you can get, you know, 15, 20, 30 percent take rates on those, especially if it's an undifferentiated product, right? If I need a new iPhone charger and there's 30 manufacturers easily that sell them on Amazon. You know what's so funny though? What like how do they make this decision? I search for flashlight. <laughs> The first result is either Amazon <laughs> Basics flashlight yeah. 
or a sponsored flashlight, well, well, yeah. which one is more profitable for them to sell? They might not even know. That's a good question. It probably depends on the product, but I would I bet the sponsored one is. You probably, think sponsored yeah. one is more no, profitable will, than their will, own? They shit. will tell you that it's it's equal, right? Yeah, Amazon fine. will say it's the same. Uh, they'll say that in court. I'm guessing that, especially <laughs> if it's a very undifferentiated product, I bet the sponsored. All right, I want to ask you about uh, the Apple antitrust thing because I think this is a very big story for yeah. the second half of this year. Apple, uh, yeah, Apple's been kind of able to get around things that we've been surprised at. Like, you know, with this antitrust ruling, one of the things that they highlighted um, was not allowing third-party digital wallets in Apple Pay. So PayPal being, you know, probably the most obvious, Venmo, you know, Cash App not being And they allowed. have crushed PayPal as a result. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. You, you can't tap and pay with PayPal on an iPhone. You just can't. And we've been surprised that they've been able to do that without any problem. In the EU, the Digital Markets Act already prevented this, and, and Apple's already opened up the NFC chip in Europe for digital other digital wallets. How is it that no American technology company can operate freely in China except Apple? You know, we haven't figured out <laughs> exactly why Apple has this kind of vaulted they operate position. freely in China? Uh, well, I don't I know if it's freely, but I think Foxconn properly. making iPhones is probably preventing civil unrest, and that's the yeah. I, I think question. that's the right answer. Yeah. But like, it, that's it's a, it's shocking how little problem they have operating yeah. uh, in China versus any other company. Even Visa and Mastercard can't operate very effectively. In Apple's China. in a thirteen percent drawdown with the market. Alt if if yeah. the market was not doing so well, Apple would be doing much worse. So yeah. I'm, here's a ratio chart of Apple divided by the S and P. Yeah. Yeah. It's down to the lowest level since 2021. Yeah, like it is. In relative terms, to your point, Michael, it's crashing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's partly because you know Apple has come down a little bit. The market's still going. Right. Up. It's had its best start right. to the year, right? So it's a little bit both coming toward each other. But I think Apple is just way too. When hundreds of billions of dollars come out of the market cap of a stock like Apple, yeah, that accrues to the benefit of Nvidia or something yeah. else yeah. similar, for sure. Right. That yeah. money's not going into a, mo a money market. I no, probably not. <laughs> yeah, okay. probably not. I, okay. I don't. I don't think so, but I don't know for sure. Okay. Uh, so you think that this might be the one that gets them though? Like this might be the one. I, I don't know. They've if, been invincible. I don't, I don't think the antitrust in and of itself is enough. First of all, it's too slow moving, right? So like it, anything that comes from the FTC, the Justice Department, you're talking about years before anything actually happens. And so I don't think that's going to be the thing. What my, although you know the uh, the ruling that's going to be coming down about the legality of Google's payment to Apple. You know, to be the default search engine on iOS devices, that would be interesting. If That's that, anti-competitive behavior as well. Uh, yeah, and 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 it, it's actually interesting to think through. Is it positive or negative for Apple? Is it positive or negative for Google? It's not obvious for either of them, by the way. Google's Why, paying it's, it's, eighteen it's billion. Expensive. Google pays eighteen billion dollars a year to be the search engine provider on iOS devices. But don't they need each other for that? I mean, I don't know. But I, if, if instead, you when you started your new iPhone and it said. You know, which search provider do you want to use? Do you want to use Google? Do you want to use Bing? Do you want to use DuckDuckGo? You know, probably most people still pick Google. I agree. But it's a, I agree. It's an expensive stock. But if I were sitting at Poland Capital <laughs> and I were one of your analysts, when you when you live in Boca, yeah. and you said right, and you said we're we're getting out of this stock because, among other reasons, in in, a, in addition to it being expensive, the timing is really bad here for them to fight an antitrust suit. I would raise my hand and I yeah. would say, yes, but Mr. Davidowitz, don't you understand? that in seven months' time, Scott Bayo is going to be running the FTC and none of this shit's going to matter. Yeah, I, I don't think the I don't think the antitrust is really that big a deal for them. I mean, okay. Not not within the next few years. Yeah, the, anyway. But they're not growing. That's, That's the issue. Yeah, yeah they're not That's growing. The they've they've yeah. tapped out the addressable market. The, by the way, most of their growth is in services today. The, what what growth the there store. is. That's Google's payment to Microsoft is the vast majority of that. So if that goes away, then you're- Google's payment to Apple. Yeah. That's, uh, that's driving most of the growth. So, I don't know. You, you book travel. You book travel on an app. Apple gets paid. You gamble on an app. Apple gets paid. Not, you play video not, games on your iPhone. Apple gets not paid. Not always. No. If, okay. If you book on Airbnb, Apple doesn't get anything. If you use the Airbnb app? Yeah. Really? They don't get anything. So that's mostly coming from like gigantic Google. Yeah. What about Netflix? No, no If you do anything in the Netflix app, you don't. I don't believe that Apple if I, gets paid. If I, if I, uh, pay Netflix on the app and I'm watching movies on the app, Apple doesn't like that because they're not getting paid? Well, most people don't watch anything on their phones. You know, they don't watch streaming sure. on their phones. Yeah, yeah. I don't about know if nine, I about 80 to 90% of viewing time is on smart TVs okay. or laptops. Okay. What yeah. would happen, what would happen, excuse me, what would have to happen for Apple's business for you to reconsider buying the stock? 
I, I think if uh, is it like the stock price or the business fundamentals? It's, of well, it's change? kind of both. They're always both together, billion, right? Billion so like, dollar share buyback. <laughs> well, they do buy back hundreds, tons of, uh, hundreds of billions yeah. of dollars. Yeah, I, no, it has to be some reason why we can see some growth and, and an acceptable valuation. Like those are things that we need. Like we need companies to be able to grow their earnings at at least a double digit rate because we don't have to. There's no nobody says we have to own Apple. So will right? they ever get back there to mid teens? No, probably not. I mean, how but could they? If they, if there's something amazing that allows them to grow revenue again. You know, if the Vision Pro is 800 bucks or whatever, 1500 bucks. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm a skeptic on AR, VR at the moment. I just think it's not when ready they came for out with time. The, when they came out with the uh, the watch did you, or the AirPod, did you think those would be big categories? No. And they were. Or uh, No. They're not? They don't move the needle. Well, they're not big, as big as phones. The, I, I mean, they barely move the needle. You're talking about 1% incremental the, revenue growth from those But products. they keep people in the ecosystem. Yeah, it's good for the ecosystem. That's okay. what it's good for. Yeah, they, yeah. They, all those things are good for the ecosystem. Is there another potential category out there as big as the phone? Well, that's no. why they were looking at cars, right? They were right. supposedly trying to develop a car. I would say no. I would say no. You're probably I knew right. they couldn't do a car because I couldn't have my battery in my iPhone last an entire day. I didn't think they'd be able to do that <laughs> with a car. <laughs> uh, are we hyping up generative AI too much? Is there going to be an earnings yes. contribution? coming from generative AI other than for three or four companies anytime so, soon? I, I don't know, but my my hunch tells me that generative AI will be important, uh, but it's not going to be as important as fast as what people think uh, because like, you can look at what's happening with NVIDIA. NVIDIA is seeing real benefit today because in order to lay the foundational infrastructure for generative AI, you need the compute to yeah. be able to do that. And NVIDIA is basically the only game in town that can do that. So obviously right. they're benefiting. Comp the, their customers like Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Meta, Chinese internet companies, they need to lay all of that foundation in the 40 million <laughs> square feet of, of space that they have. They need to lay that foundational infrastructure. And then they have it. They don't necessarily have to keep buying more of it. Eventually, they'll have to upgrade well, it. There have to be enough use cases to justify continuing to spend at the right. rate they're spending now. Now, if you listen to Microsoft and you listen to Amazon, they're saying they are starting to see some real incremental demand coming from Gen AI. How long do they have to actually be able to put up? I, I, I tell you, I don't think it's coming that fast. You know, we own Accenture in our portfolio. We've owned it for 18 years, 17 years in our portfolio. Accenture is the company that's going to help every company figure out how we had Dan Dolev at Mizuho on the show yeah. pitching Accenture for exactly the reason that you're stating. Yeah, I mean, it's like everybody needs help, right? All these companies need yeah. help doing it. Accenture is the best way to do it. And when we talk to Accenture, they're like, yeah, everybody wants to. Everybody, Everybody's interested in Gen AI. But the reality is half the companies, half of their customers, which are large, very large companies and governments, don't even have their data organized properly yet. You know, they don't even have... You know, they haven't even finished their cloud migrations yet. They have to get all of their data in the right places first, then they can organize it, then it has to be scrubbed, then maybe you can do Gen AI. So these things are coming, and I think it will be you know, probably very, very meaningful at some you point. You think there's a hiccup not, somewhere between now yeah. and the actual use cases materializing yes, yes. That, that surprises people. Now, some companies, you can see it, like we mentioned ServiceNow. ServiceNow has already got a module that allows for some of the automation to have Gen AI capabilities built into it. It'll be a modest revenue lift for them. It's, th these things are not going to like change overnight. You know, wh when I think about it, NVIDIA, which I think is an amazing company, by the way, we don't own it. We know it very, very well. Uh, I think it's fantastic, but there's, it, it's easy to kind of grasp back to the dot com days and say, is this like, something we saw back then. There's the some Cisco, things- The Cisco comp. Cisco Corning actually is the one that I that kind of bangs Ooh, around my head a little bit. That. Because uh, you know you had like the internet is going to, we need all this fiber, right? They were the, the monopoly of optical fiber. And maker. then they laid it and it went dormant until For a long time. Uh, YouTube came along. And even then there's still a lot of dormant fiber. Even today yeah. there's still a lot of dormant fiber, but it wasn't that it wasn't needed. It just wasn't needed as rapidly you know, as what everybody thinks. That's so, what makes me nervous because if it's, you don't have to be bearish on AI. You could just say to yourself, what if mm -hmm. all of a sudden Microsoft and Amazon pull the reins back yeah. on orders? Which they will. And how many companies are double order ordering GPUs exactly. just so they don't get lose their place in line? Yeah. And that's that look, this is a cyclical business. Nvidia is a cyclical business, right? We know that. It doesn't go up. It, they don't sell GPUs in a straight line. By the way, they don't just sell GPUs, right? Yeah. They sell servers and interconnect products. It's a whole, system. It's a whole thing. Yeah, yeah. By the end of this year, they're going to account for almost half of all data center CapEx globally, NVIDIA. 
right? We were t- those 40 million square feet that Amazon has, yeah. it's not just GPUs and servers that go into that. It's the electrical equipment, the cooling equipment, the building itself, you know, other, other chips and other servers that are not AI related. There's a lot of things that go into a data center. And so if NVIDIA is already almost half of that market, you know, there's there's going to be a pause. The in bulls growth. would say the stock has gotten cheaper over the last three years, not more expensive. It is. It's now, t- you say, 25 times forward earnings, which is cheaper than, I would say, most tech stocks. Yeah. But, but. <laughs> how many years worth of GPU demand yeah. are we pulling forward into the four quarters of right. this year? So let's say they do $100 billion worth of data center business this year. Which is bananas. It's bananas, right? And maybe even it grows next year. Let's give them credit, say 115, 120 billion next year. Would it shock you if they did 60 billion the next year? It would cut the it stock not, in half. It would, yeah, but it wouldn't shock me. That's the way the business works. We owned NVIDIA years ago when their data center business was a lot smaller. Yeah. And it was growing 20, uh, sorry, 30%. One quarter and then declining twenty percent. So the next that's quarter. the cyclicality that you mentioned is something that every professional investor is talking about. Why you think it's just it's just momentum is just taking over? You yeah, just, I mean they're you the can't only, not own this. Well, because they're the only obvious winner right. of generative AI right now. You know, and they well, are. that's a really important point. The yeah. menu has six items on it. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. It's I, the noticed, juicy I noticed that you're not an AMD either. Same reason, I'm guessing. Yeah, it, yeah. Partly, yeah. Just AMD has never had that consistency to it either. It's just never been a consistent growth. So if Nvidia misses, the stock trades down thirty percent. Would you be likely to buy it? If we think we can get it to a point where it looks like the fundamental growth is reasonable and the valuation is reasonable, we would own it. It's a great business. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier in the show that you think that Eli Lilly's GLP business can be bigger than... <laughs> Provocative. Yeah. I, I think both Novo and Lilly could end up having $100 billion products in their GLP Which ones. would Which they would be trillion-dollar stocks if that were true. Yeah. They're already, okay. getting, they're already getting close to it. John, throw this chart up of, of those two yeah. names. So Eli Lilly a year ago was... <laughs> This is a year? Yeah. Oh my God, it's a year. Yeah. <laughs> Eli Lilly was $300 billion a year ago and it's $750 today. <sighs> uh, Novo was a little bit larger and it's $580. Yeah. So you, do you think that these stocks are out of control expensive? I, I I don't think they're out of control. I think they're they're reasonable for the growth because this is, it's going to be similar to uh, the demand for GPUs. It's just going to be on a more linear path. That's it's sustainable. Not, it, it should be more sustainable. Now, of course, these are drugs that have pat lives to them. So you have to think beyond. I was going to say, this will be more competitive than GPUs. I, it will be, but it's they're so far ahead. Like the All next right. the next GLP ones coming to the market are coming in about two to three years and they already look inferior sorry, to the ones. Novo is Wegovy? Yeah, Wegovy and Ozempic. Is and Ozempic, the, both the same company? Yeah. And then Manjaro and is Zep, Lily? And Zepbound, yeah. And Zep, Zepbound's the new hot one. Yeah. Well, yeah. So they're basically the I same. take all four just in case. I don't- <laughs> Just double down. How are these yeah. things priced? Felt and suspended. Uh, they're pretty expensive. There's actually, uh, there was an interesting study that came out today saying it only costs about $5 to make I saw uh, that <laughs> we go be today. Now that, first of all, that that's probably not exactly right, but the cost is low. Like all you have to look at is the gross margins for Nova. They have 85% gross margin. So it's it doesn't cost much to make the drugs, but the manufacturing cost of a drug is not the biggest cost. It's the it's R&D, R&D that goes into not just that drug, but all the failures too, right? Like the people keep thinking about, you know, are they entitled to these kind of profits? Well, in, unless we want to figure out which drug candidates up front don't work, you know, how are you going to get people well, to so invest? Isn't it a double-edged like sword where you say like, okay, Medicare and all these things should pay for the cost of these things. Okay, well, sure. But then you're inviting yeah. regulators yeah. into the, so like That's once you get the federal government paying, yeah. you also are going to have the federal government saying what it should cost. Right. Now, th- yes, absolutely. And this, this space is a little bit different because when you're talking about weight loss, you know, Medicare is elderly elderly population, right? When these drugs work, you don't just lose body fat, you lose muscle mass too. And so for elderly people, that's a problem, right? Stop pumping your gym. <laughs> yeah. You should all come to my gym. We'll help you figure out that problem. I don't think but most, it, I don't think most people truly understand what that means because yeah. when these, when, when people started selling off stocks yeah. because of the GLP one, yeah. some of the stocks they sold off include Stryker, yeah. which is backwards. Yeah. People are going to become more frail You're going to need more hips, not less. Yeah, probably, right, in the short term. There's so many things about – there's a lot of misinformation in this space, unfortunately. And and there's also a lot of, like, social media garbage around this space, too. But there's about a billion people on the planet that are clinically obese. Why are you looking at me and not him when you say that? (laughs) Why the f*** are you laughing? I'm out of here. All right, go ahead. Say more. Clinically obese. And – 
you have very high risk of a lot of diseases when you're when you're clinically obese. And we already know that. And, and the studies that were done, especially Novo did a study on Wegovy that showed that if you take Wegovy over, a, I think it was a five-year period, three to five-year period, you reduce your, your body weight by over 20%, but you also reduce your chance of heart attack, stroke, sudden cardiac death, progression of diabetes, all Smoking, this. drinking. Right. It's, mor- it's like yeah, almost it, miraculous. It, it could, it, yeah, it has some interesting method of action that may actually reduce um, uh, addictive behavior, which that they're testing a lot of those things. We don't know right. if that works. But just from the real obese population, the people who should be taking the drug, uh, and not for their whole lives. That's not what you're supposed to do with this drug. You're not supposed to take it for your whole life. That is easily a $200 billion opportunity split between those two companies and maybe some others that come What if the real them. opportunity is the thing that doesn't exist yet, which is the thing you take after to not gain back 90% of the weight that you've lost? Well, I mean, this is, the is other, truly a problem. Yeah, I mean, I think this the problem is our healthcare system is not put together to be holistic, meaning- you have the the medical side, right? You have the drug, but you don't have the behavioral training, the nutrition, the fitness. Like it's all tied. It should be a holistic program that you do. And right now, it's you take the drug. It's kind of a blunt force, right? It's a it's an injectable, self injectable drug. And here's your dose, and you do it, and you do it, and you do it, and you do it once a week until you hit your weight, and then you come off it, or until you can't tolerate it. It's not the way it should be. It should be a titrated down drug as you get your BMI down or your weight. Down, down, down. You take a lower dose, dose lower dose, be, lower dose. Yeah. Maybe a very low maintenance dose for a little while as you get your behavioral change done. And then eventually okay. you come so off. So how many people do you know that are on this stuff? A few. How many people do you know that are on this stuff? One. Just one? One who admits it. Yeah. Okay. I know a lot of people who are on this stuff. Yeah. They have no intention of titrating. Well, it's not up to them. It's up make, to their doctor, but they don't the doctors aren't LOL, doing this come yet. On. Yeah. Come on. I'm from Long Island. You get a doctor to say whatever you want. My point is there is no answer to how to get off for yeah, no, the yet. people who are currently on it, which is so far okay. I think they are way healthier. These people- and So what's the trade-off, right? What's, what's the, trade-off? the trade-off? Yeah. yeah okay. I agree with that. Uh, so you're bullish though. Yeah. I think, think the va- are- like the valuations are high enough that we're, we have small positions in the two companies. So we're not like super excited about the valuations, but I am very excited about the fundamentals of both of those businesses. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Um, we got to do one more thing. Hmm. We have to recognize the passing of Daniel Kahneman, uh, who uh, passed away. I want to play something, mm-hmm. if you'll indulge me. Mm-hmm. So are people overly outcome-focused to the detriment of process? What they are, we call that narrow framing. They view the situation narrowly. Mm-hmm. And that is true in all domains. So, for example, we say that people are myopic, that they have a narrow time horizon. To be more rational, you want to look further in time, and then you'll make better decisions. If you're thinking of where you will be, you know, a long time from now, it's completely different from thinking about how will I feel tomorrow if I make this bet and I lose. I I recall reading about a study, and I hope I don't mangle this too badly, where they would take a photo of somebody and then using software age their face, and then when they were would ask the people who had the current photo of their own face, they would get a very different answer than the group that were better able to imagine themselves 25 years hence. Yeah, that's about saving. Mm -hmm. I mean, what actually happens is that when you show people a morphed image of their face as an old person, their tendency to save increases. So it's easier for them to identify with their future self. But in general, that's not what we do. People aren't especially good about that. That is, uh, of course, Barry Ritholtz interviewing Daniel Kahneman back in 2016. Not sure what prompted that because uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, the book, had already been out. That might have been something to do with Michael Lewis's book on Kahneman and Tversky. Uh, Does that sound right? The Something Game, what was that book called? That was a good book. I love that. I wanted to ask you as a professional investor, um, how important is behavioral psychology, if at all, to your research or trading? Yeah. At, like, is it something that you want to be studied up on so you can recognize some of your own cognitive issues? Yeah, 100%. Okay, so 100%. talk about that. Yeah, I, I have cognitive issues. The book, the, book is called, the book is called The book is called The Undoing Project. What did you think it was oh. called? Some, the something game? I, wow, don't I, I, about. I don't think I would have gotten that either. Yeah. Did you say The Crying Game? I was thinking The Crying Game. <laughs> <laughs> 
Conrad, well done. Conrad and Tversky in a different yeah. sense. Yeah. So, 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 tell tell us about that aspect of uh, of being a professional well, uh, investor. I think um, Dan Kahneman, by the way, has added more to our profession. You know, I, I would put him on par with Warren Buffett as far as wow. like the the education that he's provided our our industry and and even more broad, obviously than than that in just behavioral psychology in general. Um, our team is very very versed on behavioral psychology. Kahneman is, you know, kind of the guru. Um, I, I think it's exactly what you just said. It's you, you want to stop yourself from making some of those very, very human, you know, mistakes that we all do. And you never really stop making them. You just try to make fewer yeah. of them over time. I mean, I still or catch them sooner. Yeah. Catch them a little earlier, yeah, yeah. undo them a little bit faster. The way we do it on our team uh, also is we, we call each other's out. So if we notice in, one another starting to fall prey to a Damn, behavioral bias. Your hindsight bias is showing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Literally like that. that. How does that yeah. happen? You wouldn't do that over email work. No, we would do it in a meeting. Like we could, we, we have, uh, we train a lot on communication uh, and how to um, be very candid with each other, but not piss each other off and do it from a place of caring as a, as opposed to. So what's the way to do that? You would say somebody wants to hold on to a stock. Yeah. You would say. You know, Kahneman would refer to this as the endowment. Yeah. Uh, so, well, yeah, maybe, yeah, something like that. Yeah, even, even even a lighter touch. Yeah. Okay. Even a lighter touch, but something like that. Like, is When's it possible? the last time somebody called you on a on a behavioral thing? Oh, like all the time. No, but give uh, it. Like, uh, 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 trying to think of a good one more recent. It's always recency bias. Well, recent, the last time this happened, you have recency, a coworker here. I could find that yeah. in two seconds. Dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, she, she's from the public. <laughs> okay, <laughs> she's from the PR firm. All right. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I'll come up with one for you. But it, the, Michael and I do this to each other, but not about investing, really just more about how we talk to people. Yeah. And I'll check him yeah. and he'll check me. Yeah. But that's important. Like he'll call me up and say, hey, asshole, I really don't like what you just said to so-and-so about blank. Yeah. And, you know, 90% of the time he's wrong. But <laughs> I think it's important that you have coworkers that will tell you. Yeah. When you're doing something that should be obvious but isn't. Well, and that's a pull and capital thing too. We we believe in radical candor, but if you've ever read the book Radical Candor, if you haven't, it's a wonderful book. It was written Is that by a Dalio thing. Uh, no, it, no, but it's somewhat similar. But okay. Dalio does it like a little more aggressively, I think. But she is this former Google employee, senior person at Google, who wrote this book about radical candor, and it's basically like you need to be very open and honest with your coworkers, but you can't just be a, a jerk about it. You have to really care about them. And they have to know that you really care about them. And then if you do, then you can be very open and honest with them and they'll they'll take the feedback on board. So the context has to be, this is not my enemy. Yeah. Like it has to start yeah, this, with This person respect. really cares about me, is not okay. trying to undermine me, not trying to make me look bad, not trying to make me feel bad, but really wants me to succeed and is trying to help me. And if you can do that, that's fantastic. And, and there's a great, um, I don't know if you've ever read Adam Grant's books too. Adam Grant- I read originals. Okay, he has a, another book called Think Again, and it's basically how to not get yourself wedded to your ideas, and you know, so if they're wrong, you can change your mind. You don't, yeah. not, you don't like ego on them, right? And he talks about in that book about making a presentation about Kahneman. And he's talking about, uh, I think he had disproved one of Kahneman's uh, theories, which is you know, apostate, uh, unbelievable, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So he's at a conference and he's presenting, and he realizes that as he's presenting it, that Kahneman is actually sitting there in the oh, audience, amazing. right? And he's presenting it and he's nervous and uh, Kahneman is smiling the whole time. And afterwards, Kahneman comes up to Adam Grant and says, that was an amazing talk. I'm really glad I got to hear you do that. And he's like, oh, I'm, I'm relieved to hear you say that because I thought you might be mad, you know, that I was disproving something that yeah, you yeah. had hypothesized. And he said, why would I be mad? I'm not going to be wrong anymore. And I was like, think about how hard it is for anybody to just be cool with that. I think I, I, I think I saw him say this. I might have read it, but I think I saw him say this. Uh, I have no sunk costs. Yeah. So somebody asked me, like, how does he change his mind? And that's what he said. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. I mean, how many of us can say that? It's, it's we really have a couple funny. of Kahneman quotes. Michael, do you want to read these? Sure. Um, a reliable, these are, uh, okay. A reliable way to make people believe in falsehoods is frequent repetition because familiarity is not easily distinguished from truth. Authoritarian institutions and marketers have always known this fact. That's a great one. Mm -hmm. One more. Nothing in life is as important as you think it is while you are thinking about it. Uh, what does I that mean? That. I love that. Like, just chill out. Yeah. Like, oh, so when you're over thinking time about something, smaller. you're making it more important yeah. than it really is? Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, okay. everything he says is gold. Like, those are uh, – and they apply to life. You know, they, it's not, those are not just investments. Anyway, Michael Lewis wrote the book, but The Undoing Project was amazing. Yeah. Also yeah. – 
Uh, well, we don't need to go there. <laughs> okay. Don't leave us hanging. Where are we going? <laughs> Let's just wrap it up. Hey, did you have fun on the show today? I loved it. It's yeah. so great. Thank you for having uh, me. Will you come back? Of course. What are you doing tomorrow? <laughs> I'm in Boca. Okay. Want to come back to Boca? Oh, man, Go to Tucci's. <laughs> I'm telling you, I will be there very soon. Okay. Listen, this is so much fun for us. We really love talking about stocks with you. And uh, I, I certainly hope we can do it again. Um, I wanted to end the show the way we usually do, which is with a favorite. So we'll basically ask our guests if there's anything they're reading or listening to or watching or any exercise or what, like whatever they're into. <laughs> no, seriously, whatever, whatever you're into that you think the audience, uh, dozens of people are listening to this right now. So whatever <laughs> you think people to. should know more about. So sound off. What do you got? I, you know, I, I was thinking about it. I, I, it's not one I just read, but I read, you know, maybe a month ago. So there's a book called Outlive uh, by Peter Atia. Have you ever heard of yeah. Peter? No, I, I know, I know Peter through. Uh, Patrick O'Shaughnessy's, yeah. yeah. I think I saw him do a live thing with Patrick. There you go. Okay. Uh, it's a wonderful book about, he says it's about longevity, you know, but it's not about how to live longer. It's how to live healthier till you die, basically. So it's not so much about extending your life, but not having Quality those years. Yeah, yeah. Not having those years of being very sick. And what I loved about the book was it's, you know, very holistic about, you know, nutrition, physical fitness, mental health, all of that. But what Peter Atia is very good at is, when there's verifiable and reproducible fact, he will state it as that. But if it's stuff where there's a lot of confounding factors, which is a lot of nutrition, he will like, tell like you vitamins. That. There's yeah. no there's no straight answer on vitamins. But he'll say, like, look, this is what the hypothesis is. This is how your body works. So this is what's plausibly true. And he'll he'll separate out confounding factors. And as an investor, you know, what I appreciate about that because so much of what we look at, there's so many confounding factors. It's mm -hmm. very, very hard to separate the noise from the signal. So I love a book that's about a topic that we all have a hard time separating the signal from the noise from and and him very clearly laying it out. Was there one specific thing that you learned from that book that you would not have otherwise known? Uh, probably a lot. There, there was one he talks a lot about nutrition, which I liked because that's always been the toughest part for me to get right and to really even know what I'm doing. Um, but he talks about uh, intermittent fasting, which I think a lot a lot of us think is a very good thing. You know, you you limit your calorie intake in the window and and all that. But what he was saying that I didn't know is um, your body can't metabolize uh, that much protein in a very short period of time. So if you're my age, if it sounds like a dare. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, I mean, your body can take it in, yeah, yeah, but it's yeah. not going to use it very well. Okay. So uh, it'll just flush it. So the, the the idea that you need more than that window to consume the proper amount of protein, especially as you get older and you start to lose muscle mass, you need to have more and more protein intake. That was something I hadn't even thought about. Oh, before. so extend the window during yeah. which you're eating yeah, as he, you get older. Yeah, he had thought, he was an advocate of, of fasting, intermittent fasting. And then he said he kind of turned around on it a little bit because he was thinking about you know, it takes a while. You can't really metabolize oh, more than like 30 or 40 grams of protein per hour. So you really need to kind of extend that window. So if you're going to have enough protein during the day, you, you're going to need more than four hours worth of eating yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you that's can figure out why I, to do yeah, it. Yeah. No, I know. Yeah. Uh, that's why I only fast in my sleep. Uh, <laughs> Michael, do you have a favorite for us? I finally started watching Tokyo Vice. The season is done, right? Season is done? No. no. It's more than an ep episode. Duncan, the show is audio. Yeah. I, I don't think it's done. Okay. Yeah, I think it's done. You just watched the end and you didn't know? <laughs> anyway. Apparently the end is very anticlimactic. Yeah, geez. Okay, I guess- I guess we're not there, sure the end is the I guess the there end. will be a season three. Uh, I picked up right where I left off. I love this show. <laughs> Maybe I didn't watch the last episode. <laughs> All right. uh, I wanted to shout out the state of Colorado. So Michael and I just spent uh, like four days there. And uh, I had been there before, like Denver on business. Hmm. But this time we got out into- uh, the big country. Yeah. It's uh, beautiful. <laughs> as Michael's, we were driving, we were driving on the road. Michael kept saying, this is a big country. <laughs> nobody knew what he meant. Big mountains. Yeah. Uh, big mountain country. Anyway, mm. we just had an incredible time. The weather was not great, but it didn't matter. Mm. We visited this place called garden of the gods. Have you ever been there? No, I haven't been there. This is, this is, you had you had to hike. Yeah. I was okay. just in Colorado the same time you were, I think. Uh, okay. This is a good hike. It's like, uh, this 300 million year old rock formation. Oh, that really looks as though it shouldn't be possible. There are things balanced on other things of um, wild dimensional uh, variety. And it's just, it's a it's like cool. a, another planet. Neat. And it was really, really cool. And uh, we had a great time. We met an owl. We met a falcon. True. Right? True story. But really? True, like real, real shit. Uh, <laughs> the falcon grazed my, it was a handler holding the falcon so people could take selfies with it. <laughs> 
So this this kid was like, yo, take a picture with me and the Falcon. I'm like, which Falcon? Is Andre Rising here? He's like, no, just like, trust me, it'll be great. So we we pose next to the Falcon and then it lifts its wing and it grazes my shoulder like this and I run. I go, All right, I'm good with the bird. So, but that's I think that's why this is my favorite because we did some stuff that I don't normally do. That's fun. Uh, as a New Yorker. So shout out to uh, Colorado. Colorado. And a uh, big shout out to Dan Davidowitz. Thank you so much for being part of the show. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate it. We had you. so much fun. Uh, I'll see you in Boca. I'll see you at El Molino or <laughs> yeah. Tra- Trattoria. Which one do you uh, like? Yeah, Trattoria is good too. Go back and yeah, forth. Yeah, All right, we'll do both. both. All right. Dan Davidowitz, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Thanks to all the listeners. Thanks to all the subscribers, all the likers, all the commenters. Thanks for listening. We'll see you soon.